All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Talking Ball Live with Pat Leonard. A juicy episode for you here on Tuesday, April 9th, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Talking Giants, talking NFL, talking draft, talking trades up for a quarterback, perhaps. A lot on the docket uh, with the QBs front and center. Coming off some great episodes of the Talking Ball with Pat Leonard podcast, Dan Wiederer from the Chicago Tribune. Check that episode out when you get a chance. The Caleb Williams episode, talking about the Bears and the number one overall pick and a team that's going to be the talk of the town when draft weekend rolls around. But then ESPN senior NFL insider Adam Schefter joined us for an exclusive conversation about the draft. A lot of good Giants insight from Adam, but also some insight around the league about teams to watch, potential trades coming, and uh, not just in the draft, but also regarding veteran players. We are doing this on a Tuesday evening instead of a Monday because a little bit of an unorthodox week. We had the national championship game drawing a lot of eyeballs on Monday, and I will not be around for the later part of this week and early part of next week. So I wanted to maximize our ability to be deeper into this new news cycle, closer to the draft, having more information at our disposal to talk about the Giants' potential direction in this draft and where your franchise stands at the moment. Uh, we're going to get right to your questions. First, want to tell you about Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your summer sports this season, from MLB, golf, NBA, and NHL playoffs stats. All the latest stats, news, and scores available to follow your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Where I'm going to start before I get to the first question. And remember, I will go through the queue, answer every question. If you want to ask a question or have a comment addressed immediately, you can support the channel by paying for a super chat or super sticker, and I will get right to your comment or question. But that is not required. If uh, you're not purchasing a super chat or super sticker, we just ask, along with participating, just give us a thumbs up. Just hit that like button because that helps YouTube share with that algorithm around the website, around the internet. It tells people we're doing this. It helps build this community. And as I always say to you guys, I look forward to these twice a week, typically, but every week I look forward to these because I learned something and I feel like uh, we're really building something here, but that's all thanks to you. But before I answer the first question, I want to start with this. I got a text today from a source A lot of conversations right now about who the Giants like, what directions they may go. And one person texted me today, May is the guy. Now, Ralph Vacchiano from Fox Sports, my predecessor at the New York Daily News on the Giants beat, Ralph Vacchiano reported several days ago now that the Giants if they are tempted to trade up for a quarterback, they would be tempted by one player, and that is North Carolina's Drake May. And I can validate and verify that that is the way that the arrow is pointing. Now, J.J. McCarthy is still a player and a quarterback the Giants like and have done a lot of homework on. The question is where they would feel comfortable drafting McCarthy if they can't get up to draft May because they could very well like a J.J. McCarthy, but prefer him more in the late first, early second range that a Bo Nix and Michael Penix Jr. would also likely be available at, or at least ideally selected if you're looking at value on the board compared to the sixth overall pick, where let's just face it about Drake May. The guy profiles the way that the Giants like to scout and evaluate and groom quarterbacks. He's got the size, he's young, He's got the big arm. He's got a lot of talent. He's got mobility, right? Playmaking ability. Uh, He can make throws that a lot of other people can't. Sometimes the simple throws are the ones that people want to see better decision-making on. They want to see more consistency on, on the routine. But the high-level traits are there. Now, obviously, this invites very clearly and directly a comparison to Josh Allen because that's where Joe Shane and Brian Dable come from. 
a place with the Buffalo Bills, made two trades up when Brandon Bean was the GM to go and get their quarterback, Josh Allen, several years ago in the NFL draft, I believe seven overall. And you could invite those crit those comparisons very clearly by discussing the Giants and Drake May and what they would hope to get out of a player like that, which is a prospect who has a higher ceiling and already some tantalizing traits and skills to work with. Now, I've talked to plenty of people who do not, they shake off the Josh Allen comparisons. They say, this kid is good. He's not Josh Allen. But there are others who feel like Drake May's talent, his production, especially two years ago in college, and the fact that he still has room to grow with his makeup, the character, the size, the ability. There's a lot to love about Drake May. Now, could the Giants get up to get him even if they love that player? Because this is something that's important to remember. And then we'll get right to your questions here. It's important to remember that the Giants could love Drake May just as much as Ralph noted in his report, as I'm hearing now. And we've talked about Drake May and J.J. McCarthy as the two guys who were, you know, in that mix, right, for the Giants. We've been talking about that for a little while now. But even with the Giants feeling that way about a player such as Drake May, the Washington Commanders, if they're not a slam dunk for Jaden Daniels, that could be the pick there, Drake May. The New England Patriots at three, that could be the pick to New England. The Minnesota Vikings could easily be the team that charges up to trade up. Also, let's remember this. And I saw our friend Tom Curran in New England reported that the New England Patriots, if they were to trade out of that spot, would want something that started at three first round picks. Now, that was in context of if the Minnesota Vikings were charging up from 11 all the way to three. They also, remember, own two first round picks this year. So those two firsts plus another, right? The Giants, of course, that's a difficult ask there. You have this year's first, you have next year's, which could be a very high pick, plus another first. That that would be hard to stomach, hard to swallow. Um, you know, if you're Joe Shane and Brian Dable, as much as you love that quarterback, you have to think long and hard about the assets you're expending, considering the lack of talent you have at various parts of your roster as well. So that would be something for us to discuss tonight. Uh, the other thing to remember in the context of this is, and I have a podcast coming out on the Talking Ball with Pat Leonard podcast. This would be Thursday, April 10th. Trevor Sikama and I, Trevor Sikama, of course, is the NFL lead draft analyst at Pro Football Focus. Trevor is fantastic on video, audio, podcasting, draft analysis. Trevor's great. And he was kind enough to join us and do a seven round mock with the Giants. And one thing we discussed is that the top three is really going to be hard to crack no matter what these teams like, like the Giants. Like if they like Drake May, hey, great if you want to get into the top three, but good luck, right? So that trade to four with the Arizona Cardinals may be the one that we're looking at more closely because both teams are more comfortable with either only moving up two spots and what it costs or only moving back two spots and not trading yourself out of a certain player, right? If you're the Arizona Cardinals and Monty Austin for it. And then remember, Adam Schefter says on my podcast right here on this YouTube channel and on the Talking Ball podcast on Apple and Spotify, wherever you get it, if you listen on audio, Adam Schefter said that he thinks the Giants are very much in play for a quarterback. But his guess is that their first pick will not be one, that based on how the draft will fall, that won't be a um, that that won't be a place where the Giants necessarily end up with the QB, that it could very well be their next pick. Now, I thought Schefter very interestingly noted two things. One, if they don't pick a quarterback at six, Adam seemed to think that their next pick likely would still be one. So that could be a trade up into the back of the first. That could be using the pick at number 47. 
I think momentum is building for if you want a quarterback in that range, you're going to have to move up from where that Giants pick is, which obviously calls into question giving up 39 overall for Brian Burns if you're hunting a quarterback there. The other thing Adam noted that we can also talk about here, this is something I have hammered too in, in my reporting in the New York Daily News and talking to you guys here. And thanks for being patient on getting to the questions, but just a lot to unload and, and, and discuss right now. The other thing is he noted that part of the reason why they might not draft a quarterback in the first round is that, is that they're a team that's, and this is his words, quote, trying to win right now. Now, we know that a lot of this conversation is about what trajectory the Giants are on, what timeline they're on, the coach and GM, pressure, et cetera. Let's be honest. Adam saying that out loud reinforces what I have been reporting and telling you, which is that when you make a trade for Brian Burns like that and you pay him more than any edge rusher other than Nick Bosa and you give up a high second round pick in that draft for him, when you make those types of moves and do the types of things the Giants are considering right now and have done in free agency, this is not, as much as Joe Shane preaches, this is still a long-term deal. This is not a long-term looking into the future, continue to build and have patience in 2024 for some growing pains. No, 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 none of that. None of that. This is a assemble a team that can compete now. Yes, they're still building for the future. And yes, they inherited a, a, like a roster that was had a ton of holes, had a ton of needs. But Joe Shane's first two drafts, haven't helped them adequately fill a lot of those needs. And so there's pressure on him and pressure on Brian Dable. So I think that was really interesting that um, I think that was really interesting that Adam noted that they were trying to win right now, but again, not a surprise based on what we've talked about. Right. And how does that reflect on the coach and GM? We'll see. All right. Getting on to the questions. Chris checks in with a $5 super chat. Chris, thank you so much for the support. Really appreciate you. What is the upside for J.J. McCarthy, Chris says? All I see is Alex Smith uh, and should take him if he's just a game manager. So Alex Smith is a, is a was a quarterback when he was coached by the right coaches who could win, who could get you into the playoffs, who could, uh, who, you know, with the Chiefs, obviously, um, had them as contenders, right? Um, a player who, if he's not coached by the right coaching staff necessarily, might struggle a little bit, might come off as more mediocre, right? Isn't in the elite class, but you can win games with him. Now, is that the ceiling for J.J. McCarthy, or is that what he most likely settles into, but he has more upside than that? I think, Chris, a lot of people in NFL circles feel like J.J. McCarthy's ceiling is higher than Alex Smith, even though I totally understand your point and agree that it is easy to see J.J. McCarthy translating into a good but not necessarily great quarterback, especially because you have this gaping hole in the evaluation of what all these throws from J.J. McCarthy would look like at the NFL level because of the offense he was asked to run at Michigan and how it was more managing the game and how this was a, a physical, well-rounded team that could run the ball and play defense and didn't need to open it up and air it out, right? So he's, made, he's shown he can make clutch throws. He has athleticism. He's shown that he's intelligent, right? And he's knocking team socks off when it comes to the whiteboard and meeting them and meeting everybody in these organizations. I'm not sure if it's fair to say that Alex Smith would be the ceiling, but I get what you're saying about what are we looking at when we're picking number six overall, you would want to feel more like you're getting someone who is an obvious home run rather than a developmental project who could turn into something more than what a lot of people think he is. Right. And I think that's fair. I think that's why in the end, Chris, this isn't a this is not a black and white answer, but that's why it's in the eye of the beholder. 
That's why Daniel Jones at six to Dave Gettleman and the Giants was the right pick to them because they felt like he was worth that. A lot of other people didn't. And it turns out he likely wasn't a six overall talent, but he wasn't a bust there either, right? He wasn't a total bust. He's a player who it turns out is not the Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow, franchise changing guy, right? So the Giants had conviction in that moment back then to make that selection. The question now is, which team feels like a quarterback like JJ is obviously worth a top 10? And frankly, they don't care what anybody else thinks because their evaluation has that guy sky high. Candy man, always helping drive in the conversation. Checking in early as I might not make it tonight. 100% against trading up for May for two reasons. One, two boom or bust for my liking. And two, don't want to give up much needed draft capital for a guy who is at best third ranked QB on the Giants board. Well, you could say he's the third ranked QB on the board, but first of all, it's possible he could be the second based on their what they look for, right? Like, listen, the Giants, like if they had their pick, if they had the number one overall pick last year, they would have taken CJ Stroud, not Bryce Young. Like if that if that's where they stood, that's where the Giants would have gone. One of the reasons, and this was a common theme among some NFL teams who had reservations about Bryce Young, was that slight frame, right? Now, Jaden Daniels is not Bryce Young when it comes to that slight frame. He's he's a taller guy, right? Not as small as Bryce Young. But what I mean is the prototype of what the Giants are looking for much more tracks towards a Drake May and that build, right? much more tracks towards that. So when we say these things and we talk about these types of players, we don't know where Drake may stands on the board behind a Caleb Williams. That's first of all, is it likely that it's third? Is it possible that it's that he's third possible, but it's possible he's second too. And I would just say this about, um, about Drake may. Okay. So, like when I talked to Phil Sims on the podcast, you can watch that episode as well. Uh, that's here on the YouTube channel at PL on NFL, by the way, the handle YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, threads. Uh, on X, I'm P Leonard NYDN. Like Phil was saying that Drake May is a good prospect to him. And he says there are some throws he makes that are borderline unbelievable, right? Like jaw dropping. But he said, he misses too many easy passes for his liking, for Phil's liking. Yeah, so you you can look at different people and find, you know, um, and find people who, you know, would be jumping at the opportunity to get a Drake May. And then you have others who think that, you know, this is somebody that you need to work with, not sure what he's going to turn into. But the high-level traits are there. But Candy, I think you bring up a good point, though. It's it can be personal preference too. Let's see. Jacob Petruzzi, hit that like button and sub button for Pat on the way in. Thank you, Jacob, for always uh, bringing it and supporting the channel. All right. Jacob says, if rumors about Arizona are true, I highly doubt four is open for business. In my opinion, if we want JJ or another QB, five is the spot. No one is giving up three firsts for the fourth pick. Jacob. Um, you know, we all know that, listen, even though that's only one pick up, right? That fifth pick, like that's actually more of a, a palatable trade up than, you know, the charge up to three, right. Or even two, I mean, that like Adam Schefter was telling me that he thinks McCarthy is most likely to go in the eight to 12 range, like like the way that Adam said it was he feels like he can envision it becoming a trade-up scenario where one of those teams, like the Vikings, the Broncos, the Raiders, right? Vikings, Broncos are teams I think a lot of people are trained on when it comes to McCarthy, if not the Giants, that Adam was saying a trade from 11 or 12 to 8, 9, or 10 versus up to 3 or 4. 
it makes more sense and is more likely to happen because of both parties not wanting to trade too much or trade out of too premium of a player. Not saying that the trade all the way up won't happen and can't happen. It could. But the prices, as you're alluding to, could be very high, right? Thank you for that question, Jacob. Jacob also says, I wonder how aggressive Minnesota will be since Schefter, Schefter said on your pod that Houston initiated the trade, not Minnesota. Yeah, that was interesting. I think that, that colored in some lines about where Houston is going and the fact that I thought that was really fascinating for Adam to explain how he had an idea from that point that Houston wasn't done. And well, you know, lo and behold, how they use that second round pick and what they go and do with Stefan Diggs. But I would take that with a grain of salt too, Jacob, because I think Minnesota not necessarily looking for just extra first round ammo, but it, in this case, that's something that helps their ultimate goal of getting a quarterback. And frankly, as much as the Kirk Cousins contract wasn't going to be something that the Vikings invested in, Kirk Cousins and Kevin O'Connell in Minnesota were like this. You could see that on that quarterback show. And so O'Connell not having his guy means he's going now to get his guy. Like it's almost like, okay, we're not going to pay your guy and we're not going to make that investment, but we are going to go get you a quarterback of your own. And that's how I think a lot of people are viewing it and why the, even, even though Adam noted that about the trade conversations with Houston and Minnesota, and you're right, that was interesting. Um, I think in the end, the point holds that Minnesota did load up with ammo and is ready to possibly charge up. But still, you know, it's more palatable to move up to 10 for Minnesota and not have to expend as many assets. Chris checks in with another five bucks. Thanks, Chris. He says, to me, win games this past year might cost the GM and head coach their job, not able to upgrade QB this offseason. Right, those wins late in the season. And Chris, think about this. That tracks back to not trading Saquon at the deadline because John Maris said they were still trying to win, still trying to keep players around Daniel Jones, still trying to uh, not give up on the season. And this all ties together, right? Fascinating. Not to mention that the Giants were winning games when they won games down the stretch their defense is tied for the league leading takeaways and goes on an enormous run under Wink Martindale of uh, forcing turnovers and helping the team win games when the season is basically already over. And then Wink Martindale forcing those turnovers and that defense helping them win the games. Does that end up screwing the regime that he ends up butting heads with and the, the Dayball Shane regime and the Dayball Martindale and Kafka and that whole scenario does Martindale helping them win games end up screwing them over after that whole thing exploded at the end of the season? There's so many like different revolving doors and layers to this. It's crazy. Jacob says, you think guys like Xavier Worthy, Brian Thomas, et cetera, are going to be available in the second round? Uh, Worthy, I would think would be. Thomas, not sure. Uh, do I agree with Schefter that O-line could be the move at six? Possible. A lot of people I talk to feel like that should be wide receiver, not O-line, based on tackle availability later. This is also why a trade back could end up being the case to get it into that run of tackles there and get some assets if you're not going with something else up high. Um, you know, I think based I still I still I know. Listen, Adam is Adam. He is he's here. Right. He's the gold standard in this news breaking business. Right. And he's the ultimate insider. So I'm not going to I'm not going to say Adams wrong, but I am so convinced the Giants are. You know, they're all over figuring out a way to get a quarterback here. And so maybe they don't get it at six, but I do think they're trying very hard. Memo Mello says, I don't get how are the Giants supposed to win now with the current QB room? Is the plan to go all in on Daniel Jones again? No rebuild. What's the future plan? Well, Memo, this is why they're in a real, they're between a rock and a hard place, the Giants are, because now they're deep enough into their window as a regime where their roster isn't fixed, right? And so they have a lot of needs. They're trying to do both. That's the best way I could say it. 
they're trying to do both because right now it's no longer year year one patients undo all these mistakes, fix the cap. Now the mistakes you're undoing or the positions you're drafting over or the holes you're plugging are the ones you created or failed to fill, right? Because we're deep enough into that window. So the answer to your question is, it's really difficult to do either thing. And this is the Giants keep getting caught in this in-between land where they have one foot on either side of the line and they're kind of building their, but they're also trying to win. Now teams have done this, but it's extremely difficult to do. Extremely difficult to do. And no, the plan is not to go all in on Daniel Jones and forget, and forget it. And, um, you know, um, and just pretend like everything's fine when it's not a quarterback, especially with the injury history. The plan is to create a pathway to move on from him while employing him and trying to get something out of him in the short term. But also, I'm sure you guys saw this. Dan Duggan from The Athletic reported on some very interesting details to Drew Locke's contract. So his contract initially, the reports were one year, five million. Usually contracts are reported as like one year up to 8 million. And then it turns out it's only 5 million guarantee with incentives, right? This, this time we find out on the back end, it's one year, 5 million guaranteed, but it could be worth up to eight with 3 million in incentives. And where are the incentives stacked up in? Playing time. He can get 250 K for things like 40% of the snaps played, 50% of the snaps played, 60% of the snaps played. It's incredible, is it not, that Drew Locke and his agents felt like it was a possibility that he could earn money, that he could play almost 40 or 50% of the snaps to earn extra money, is it not? Although, does this not reinforce our reporting a month ago that Drew Locke very much his understanding, and this is John Schneider from the Seahawks as well, saying it on the radio, but also my independent reporting, that um, that this was a scenario where Drew Locke arrived here understanding he would have a chance to compete for a starting job, that he would have a chance to compete to play, especially with Daniel Jones' health not necessarily being a certainty in any in any case. And we saw, I believe it was Mike Lombardi, the former GM, reporting that uh, he said that, um, what was this, in one of his podcasts like a month and a half ago, that Jones's uh, rehab was not necessarily on schedule. So you kind of put all these pieces together. Very, very interesting. Chris says, why are the Giants so afraid to do a full rebuild? Well, it was looking like they were going to do a full rebuild, Chris, and then They won some games early and then they made the very curious decision. They're trying to sign Saquon Barkley to a multi-year deal and use the tag on Daniel Jones. They fail to get Saquon Barkley's deal done. So they turn around and hand him the tag and they give Daniel Jones a four year, $160 million deal. I mean, you tell, you tell me, you know, that's, that's walking yourself out of a rebuild is what that is. You know, you pay Andrew Thomas, you pay Dexter Lawrence. And you don't pay one of your leaders of your team, one of your best players, say Quan Barkley, and that undercuts everything you start doing and you're trying to do and you're, how you're operating going into a colossal failure of a season in 2023. So the understanding, especially bringing Joe Shane in, what it was starting to look like was a situation where they finally had a general manager who understands that this isn't just going to happen one or two years. Not to mention it was a general manager who wasn't hitched to the end of Eli Manning's career. So now it felt like you had a cleaner slate of, listen, we know we've screwed up. We know we've tried to win late with Eli. We know it backfired. We know all these things happened. Now let's just clean the slate. Unfortunately, Joe Shane's personnel decisions, draft decisions, right? Not everything is hit. He's made some good decisions, right? Bobby Okereke was a great signing. I frankly like Deontay Banks a lot as a first round pick. Um, I think he he has to room to grow, obviously, but I like Deontay Banks. Um, and I think uh, he's a gamer. He's a competitor. And um, 
Let's see. What other decisions did I like that Joe Shane has made? Um, you know, I don't know what it'll turn into. I liked the I liked the thinking on Jalen Hyatt, right? I like the process of that pick and the idea of adding speed to a team. Um, Tyrod Taylor as a signing, frankly, was, um, you know, might have saved some, might have saved uh, the, the big guy, maybe the coach, at least at his job last year, um, given some of the injuries. So, uh, but the fact of the matter is, Chris, to, is a long-winded way of answering your question, but it's a good one. They weren't afraid of doing it. They just are in the cycle where they hire a new staff. They experience some early success or some promise or some arrow pointing up swings. And it feels like the Giants continue to make the same mistake over and over, which is invest in that team and believe that they finally have it figured out. Right now, John Mara did walk this comment back a few months later. But his comment to Ian O'Connor, who was with the Post at the time, in the locker room in Minnesota after that wild card win, we're back, was so indicative of how the Giants haven't recently been able to handle a little bit of promise or success, and they haven't been able to stay on track for that long-term process. Now, Chris, you could make the argument that even though there's a lot of pressure coming off a bad season last year and poorly run staff, that if you just stick to your guns, that this is a long-term thing and you tune out the noise that you could still get the long-term process rebuild done. But unfortunately the reality in the NFL is like for the giants, for example, you're playing in a division where based on Washington possibly being competent for the first time in forever, you're looking at trying not to finish last in your division this year. The Eagles, who knows if they'll figure out their end of season woes, but they are super talented. The Cowboys are a much more talented team and have continued both of those teams outside of that late season win the Giants just had over the Eagles. Both of them bludgeon the Giants most of the times they play. So if Washington gets a little bit competent, now you're the Giants looking at, well, we're not just looking to rebuild and and get stomped as we continue to piece this, this tackle together and this guard and that corner. And like, that's not how the NFL works. The NFL is cutthroat. The NFL is ruthless. This is a billion dollar industry. You know, if you don't, if you don't show some progress and have some success, you're out. So that's, that's a long winded way of explaining that. Thank you for that question. MJ checks in with 20 big ones. MJ, wow. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. You guys are awesome, man. I, I, I love this community. I love doing these. Thank you so much for the support. All right. MJ says, if Dable and Shane can get their quarterback at six or trading up, great. If not, don't force it. Grab a wide receiver and trade back into the round if they like Penix or Knicks. Otherwise, let's accumulate picks and fill offensive line, wide receiver, Defensive tackle and quarter. MJ, right off your question, I want to remind everyone, I said this earlier, but this question is a great jumping off point for tomorrow morning on Thursday, April 10th. I will post my seven round mock draft with Trevor Sykema from Pro Football Focus. And we address, let's see, we address all four of those extra positions in this mock draft that MJ just brought up. Obviously, the Giants have six picks in this draft going in, but MJ brings up four needs. And I'll tell you this, I'll tease it that we hit all four of those and more in the Giants draft that Trevor and I did. So I, I would really recommend checking that out. I think you'll like some of the names we picked. Um, very interesting results to this draft. I will say that. Now, MJ, you bring up a good point. That's the fact that, especially coming off of my my conversation with Adam Schefter, when I talked to Adam and he said that he thinks the Giants could very well get a quarterback, not at six, maybe that next pick, my mind went immediately to the Roma Dunze, Michael Penix Jr. combo. The, the fact that I am still convinced, and I, I referenced this in our last chat, Dane Brugler from The Athletic. I know his The Beast is coming out, I believe, on the 10th. So looking forward to that. 
Dane Brugler said on the athletic podcast that Malik neighbors would have been his top player on the board. If he had come out in either of the last two NFL drafts, the entire board. So it is to me, I think that who knows how it goes. Obviously a huge run at quarterback could happen early and it could push top receivers down the board. But if you go with the premise that at least two quarterbacks are going in the top three, maybe three. And if you say neighbors and Harrison Jr. are guys who would be first and second overall picks in any other draft if there weren't so many QBs coming out. If you talk about it like that, it does feel likely like the Giants are staring at Roma Dunze at six overall or Joe Alt, obviously from Notre Dame, right? The left tackle. So those are, those are possibilities. That's a strong, strong, strong possibility. Like that scenario to me of all the ones we keep throwing against the wall, I feel like that's a pretty realistic one. And if they get Roma Dunze and they're looking in late first trade up territory for a quarterback, are you going Bo Nix or are you going Michael Penix Jr. and teaming the wide receiver and the quarterback together? And because you're a team that's trying to win now, Penix Jr. is a guy who's more ready to go plug in and go. I'm not saying he's at the NFL veteran level, but as far as how he throws the football, right? So if the Giants aren't in a develop a guy for one to two years and play, let's face it, this is New York. You're drafting a quarterback. If you're drafting him high, if he's any, if he's any good, he's playing pretty early, right? Especially if you don't have a good team to begin with. So MJ, um, I think what you say is prudent and sound, and that is that it very well could could work out that the Giants have the QB in mind. And like I said, May is the guy. That was the text I got today. Of, of course, Ralph Vacchiano had reported for Fox Sports that um, May is the quarterback that could tempt the Giants to come up in a trade up, right? Now, but to your point, MJ, if you can't get up there or if the price is so high, it's so astronomically high, you're mortgaging your present and your future just for this one player, right? Do you stay at six, get a good player, and still go get a quarterback in that late first, early second round? It's an interesting debate. It's an interesting debate because, as somebody noted earlier, if you're not fixing the quarterback, how much does the rest of it matter? That's a, that's a great point, too, I think. Chris checks in with another five bucks. Chris, you are rocking it tonight. Love it. Do you, I do think really bad for us made the playoffs in year one. It hurt us in the long term. Yeah. Making the playoffs in year one hurt very much Um, in terms of not necessarily like, so I got some, some tightness up here, man, doing a lot of work, a lot of screen time, you know, podcast on, on this silly thing all the time on the phone, you know? So, um, you know, got to work out the kinks sometimes, you know? Let's see. So, yeah, it wasn't just that, like, obviously it's not bad to win. It's about maybe misjudging your roster off of results in a season like that is the thing. Like, you you can't look at a year like that and see it for more than what it was. And that is part of the mistake the Giants made is saw it for more than what it was. But it's so interesting that they saw it as this one thing, and yet they end up – you know, yes, they pay some guys off of it, but they don't pay the running back and the leader. And then you have Kayvon Thibodeau coming out and saying that he should have gotten paid before Daniel Jones, right? And so you said you have the team failing and then they should have traded Saquon, but they didn't want to give up on the season. They kept them. They they win a few more games. They win themselves out of a top draft pick. Now they might not get the quarterback they need to fix the franchise. Wow, right? All right, let's see. Memo also checks in again. Thank you, Memo, with some with more support. And let's see. Memo says, if we have a bad season again and don't draft a quarterback this draft, do you think Dable gets another year and a chance to draft and mold a young QB in 2025? No. I think if the Giants have a bad season this year, he will not be their head coach next year. And remember, Bill Belichick, uh, Mike Vrabel, Pete Carroll, like these are guys who are not head coaches right now in the NFL. I mean – you have a bad season again after a disaster in 2023 
and Dable doesn't like prove himself better in any of these areas in 2024, no, he would not be the he would not be the head coach. Jacob says, Pat, could you imagine NFL putting Giants and Eagles in Brazil because of the Saquon situation? Uh, you know, I was wondering about that, Jacob. I don't think so. I hadn't heard anything about that. Um, we will see if that's the case. Um, I have no information on that. Nobody, nobody gave me the indication when I asked around about it that it would happen. Uh, you know, the Giants were in a lot of primetime games last year and it didn't go well. So I don't think they're gonna, I don't think they're gonna be propped up as much this year for sure. But you know, we'll see. Hunter, good to see you, man. Hunter says Darren Waller needs to get his head out of his rear end, make up his damn mind on retirement or not. I don't care. Either way, just make up your mind. Not fair to the Giants, especially draft time. Hunter, I will say this. I know I've defended I've defended Darren here, and I still defend, you know, his personal space and the ability to make a decision on his time um, in general, right? In theory, that the idea that it's not necessarily as easy for him as it might seem to us on the outside. But reading uh, Vic Tafer's report in The Athletic and Waller essentially saying, I'm still not decided and I'm going to take more time. I'd ideally like to make a decision by draft night, but I don't want to hold myself to that. Definitely will make a decision by summer break, I think is how he phrased it. I mean, you know, this almost strikes me, Hunter, as like, you know how it got out. It got reported. I believe uh, Ryan Dunleavy from The Post reported back at the Combine that Waller was was considering retirement. And then um, there was a whole back and forth about, you know, what was happening there and from the team's end, from Waller's end, whatever. Um, that um, That Waller situation could be a deal where – he kind of has already made up his mind and talked to the team, but because it got out, they want to make it look like it's, um, you know, this isn't like conspiracy theory stuff, but it's just like, they want to, they want to show that they are giving him the proper time and they're not putting pressure on him. But in the end that the parties behind the scenes know which way it's going to go, if that makes sense. This just doesn't feel like a player who's ready to play an NFL season. And, you know, I don't mean that in any uh, negative or critical way. Um, I just mean that in like a, just an objective takeaway kind of way. Antonio, great to see you. Great to see you. Thanks for being here. Antonio says, I keep seeing that the Giants are in the market for another running back in free agency. Kareem Hunt, Ezekiel Elliott would be good additions. Yeah, I think a late round running back in the draft is also possible. They have been in that veteran running back market. Um you know, you could maybe go for an early down guy in free agency or in the draft to complement a Devin Singletary, who is like a three down guy, but undersized, right? Receiving uh, receiving capabilities. So maybe you're looking for an early down guy. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on there. Um, can't tell you exactly who they're tracking towards, like definitely, you know, signing um, one over another or what direction that's going to go in the immediate future. It was interesting to me, by the way, a lot of you guys had asked about Isaiah Simmons. Um, didn't necessarily think that that reunion was going to happen. Um, that interested me. You know, this is a different defensive scheme. Um, I think Martindale did an excellent job utilizing him, and I talked to Simmons about that. I mean, he loved playing for him. Played basically on every spot of the defense. So we'll see if he's utilized the same way, utilized just as efficiently. I thought that was interesting. Antonio says, what have you heard about the potential price to get to number three if the Giants want to trade up? Uh, same things that you've heard, really, if you've been consuming all this draft content. Um, you know, obviously, six to three is supposed to be three twos. That's generally the price. But, you know, if you have that real competition from a team like the Vikings from 11, it's just going to have to come up. It's going to have to come come higher than that. Um the Giants' best draft assets are this second, this year's second rounder at 47, next year's first, and next year's second. Um, you know, hefty, hefty price to pay if you had to give up two twos and a one. That would be a hefty price to pay. I'm not, uh, you know, I know that we've discussed and I've thrown out in hypotheticals a Kayvon Thibodeau name. You know, I just bring up that name because it's a young, high draft pick, young player on the Giants roster. You know, if you look at their roster high up on the um, desirables as far as like age, the position he plays, right, that kind of thing, a pass rusher, double-digit sacks last year, 
But, you know, it's possible that the Giants, if they really did have to sweeten the pot much better than they wanted to, could dip into their roster. The problem is they just don't have a lot of elite players, you know, like you're not, you know, are you trading Bobby Okereke? Who's really like your only home run free agent signing, right. Um, in a trade to go up and get a quarterback, right. Like, it, you know, when he's really like your only like certifiably, definitely reliable linebacker. So that's what becomes hard for the giants. Would you expect the Giants to address corner and safety position before, during, or after the draft? I think corner is going to be a draft pick. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they draft one. And then also the veteran corner and safety, like bargain markets after the draft. Um, I think those are things to watch. Like you see how they fill or don't fill those positions in the draft. And then from there, they can make a decision about, um, you know, poaching somebody in free agency and investing um, and investing something. One second. Got to plug in this computer here because forgot to plug it in before and don't want to run out of juice during the chat. So give me one second. Usually get that tech all set up before uh, the live chat. So uh, apologies for that, but this is, you know, it's the, the real life situation, right? This is how we roll. All right. Um, right. So, yeah, um, we do draft a corner in the mock draft that I did with Trevor Sikama uh, from Pro Football Focus. So you can watch that episode tomorrow on the Talking Ball uh, podcast here on the YouTube channel or listen to it on Apple or Spotify. Uh, download it there. and. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is they need somebody who can tackle on the outside at corner and they do have a need at safety. I'm glad you brought that up as well. But, you know, I would forget any like highly paid players like you're going bargain shopping, trying to find value and depth. And that's why I think it's important really at this juncture. You want to see if you end up investing a, a more significant asset in a young cost controlled player at these positions before you make any kind of investment um, from that sense. MJ checks in again. MJ says, MJ with 10 more bucks, huge supporter of the show tonight. Appreciate you, MJ. He says, I want Dable. He got hurt by good coaching and winning season one. If they go six and 11 or seven and 10, but May Daniels or another rookie is starting mid season and looking good. Doesn't Dable get another shot? MJ, that is a qualifier there for sure. I totally agree with you on this point that you just raised. And that is that if they draft a quarterback and they hit on that quarterback and Brian Dable is showing he's developing the quarterback that he invested in, right? Then why would you bail if he's proving, hey, look at this magic. We just worked with Josh Allen. I'm doing it again with Drake May, right? Of course, you're not bailing on that. No question about it, MJ. Because the fact is, he would be in that, in, in your scenario, he would be highlighting that I am a quarterback whisperer and I am the offensive coach that you need. And we are turning this around. And I am impacting in a, in a positive way, in a franchise changing way, the most important position in the sport. So, when I bring up those ideas we're talking about earlier about like the doomsday scenario about like if, if this team loses again and has problems persist and the roster looks bad and the quarterback position isn't solved, then you're looking at having a new coach next year. But if Brian Dable, even if the team doesn't make the playoffs or have a winning record, right? If they win some games and they show some progress and he's developing a young quarterback, who looks like the future, that is a totally different scenario. But that's why it's interesting, MJ, and this is a conversation we've had here, but it's it's hard to know what the answer is. Does it buy Brian Dable more if you – is it drafting this quarterback 
to show you can develop the guy to buy yourself more time if you're Brian Dable? Or is it dangerous to go get the QB and expend the assets for the QB when your team isn't good enough and you need a better receiver or a better offensive lineman and a corner and a D tackle? And an, right, you need these players to help you win. Which pick helps the coach more and helps the program more and the franchise more? That is a that's an interesting debate and one we've had here and one we will continue to have. MJ, thank you so much again for the support and the great questions. All right, let's get some more of the queue here. I got to I got to slide down and and hit all these. You guys have been great and patient. My estate 98 tumbler here by the way. One of our sponsors. Essentia Day Cafe from El Salvador dates back to 1798. Go check it out. You can buy it on TikTok. You can buy it on Instagram. Uh, you can buy it on their website. I think it's Drink Estate 98 or Estate 98 Coffee on various websites. Check it out. All right, let's see. Um, thoughts on the Giants? Possibly a Kella, signing a Kella Witherspoon from the Rams. Coming off a solid season from a price standpoint, I think he would make sense. Yeah, those are the types of names um, to keep an eye out for on the veteran market. I don't have any indication that they're close to signing a specific player, though, Antonio. Have the Giants shown interest in re-signing uh, Tyree Phillips and Justin Pugh? Tyree Phillips, I think that's an injury that's going to take a while. Uh, that's not He's not going to be a part of the solution this year, at least from my understanding. Um, Justin Pugh, I think he's a player. We talked in J January, I believe about how he's going to be a guy who kind of sits and waits. And let, just like we were talking about the Giants looking at corners and safeties coming out of the draft and kind of trying to find a guy who's the right fit for their team. Justin Pugh is a guy, I think, who has the luxury of waiting and watching and seeing how the dominoes fall and looking at rosters. Like if I'm Justin Pugh right now, like he loves New York. And I don't want to speak for him, but I know it would be – um, for Justin Pugh, that would be the type of player who maybe joins up with a team where he he fills a need at a starting need at left guard and also has a chance to win. Um, now, I'm not saying that's not going to be New York, but I'm saying that players in that scenario, like in it, when they're veterans like that, they typically end up in that position of, you know, you can't necessarily be choosy uh, as choosy as, a, of course, a top free agent in, in early March, but you're selective about joining the right fit. And then teams that sign you at that point are looking for you, right? So I don't think I don't think either of those guys is part of the solution here. Antonio says, would you sign would you say Austin Schlotman, who we signed to a two-year deal, is guaranteed to be the backup center behind JMS? Looks like that he was signed, that's what he was signed for. Jacob says, you think Kafka feels slighted that Tierney took some, away some of his responsibilities play calling? Uh, Jacob, I think that was definitely related to why Kafka was on the way out until the Giants prevented him from going to Seattle. Um, I don't necessarily, in that scenario, to me, I don't think that would be Kafka versus Tierney and like uh, angry at Shea or that kind of thing. That's the head coach's decision to pull it away from Kafka and give it to his guy, Tierney, the quarterback coach. So that would more be like a head coach offensive coordinator issue. Um, looking forward to the next to the next headline and byline that uh, the Mike Kafka and Brian Dable don't have uh, any issues and that everything's fine and that nothing happened. Um, but, you know, we all know the reality. And yes, the fact of the matter is, Jacob. Ryan Dable took away play calling from uh, from Mike Kafka on multiple occasions last year and uh, looks to be taking away play calling likely from him full time now. And of course, giving it to the quarterback's coach away from the offensive coordinator. Um, how would you react to that? How do I think the starting return job competition will end up between Isaiah McKenzie, Gunnar Olszewski? And do you think McKenzie would have the edge due to the familiarity with Dable? I think the priority needs to be catching the ball. Um, you know, you look at those two guys, I see maybe McKenzie being the kick returner and Gunnar Olszewski being the punt returner in that scenario. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. You can't have, you can't keep a thousand wide receivers. 
Savage Steve, what's up? What do you feel is going to happen in the draft for the Giants, Steve says? Like if you were going to place a bet on what the Giants would do in round one, what would it be? Thanks for the insight again. Steve, I would I would bet on them getting a quarterback in the first round, whether it's at six or in a trade up into the back of the first. I think they really want a quarterback. Um, I think the most likely scenario is – Based on like if if all the teams ahead of the Giants do what I think they might do, I think Roma Dunze at six. Um, you know, Joe Alt at six, like to me, I wouldn't mind drafting a tackle there, but you know, the Giants, I mean, boy, do they need offensive weapons badly. And there are some elite ones available here. Steve, I guess I would say if I had to bet $10 on the pick, I would say Roma Dunze, Washington. But I think the Giants want to take a quarterback. They're trying to get a quarterback. I think, and as I said, you know, getting a text today, May is the guy um, that's, of, of course, validating Ralph Vacchiano, my predecessor at the Daily News' report, that if the Giants trade up for a quarterback, Drake May would be the guy to tempt them. So. Um, hope that answers your question, Steve, always supportive of the channel, always great insights and great questions. Thanks so much. MJ checks in with another 10 bucks. MJ bringing it tonight. MJ says, so if that's the case, I think it hints that they go all in. If they find their guy, Dable will mortgage the future. If he finds the guy, he wants division titles, playoffs, and Super Bowl. need an elite elite quarterback. Take a swing. MJ. I don't disagree with you. I, I, I don't disagree with you. And I, you know, I think it's not a question of whether they want that guy. I think it's a question of whether they can get that guy. That's how I feel. Do I expect Brian Dable to call the plays this season? Yes, I do. Stack the roster, then take Cam Newton, AKA Joe Milton in the fourth round. <laughs> yeah. Have a great conversation with Trevor from PFF too about that like whether or not to take a guy like Joe Milton in the fourth or the fifth, because, you know, they want to have a quarterback, a, a rookie quarterback in this quarterback room, a guy who can develop and take over, right? Uh, whether it's, you know, in week three of this season, week six of this season or next season. But if you're the Giants and you haven't drafted a quarterback by the fourth or fifth round, are you using that pick on a quarterback who's not going to contribute to this year's team when you, Brian Dable, are on the hot seat, are you taking a flyer on a fourth rounder there? Or are you taking a position player who you hope can help your roster and fill some needs and help you win some games? Another part of the debate. Antonio says, what's the expectation about where John Runyon will start, left guard or right guard? Um, Antonio, Runyon said he prefers left guard. So even though he played right guard last season for the Packers, I think it's possible left guard is his starting spot. And I'm doing some stories for the New York Daily News that will run, I believe, next week, maybe this weekend and next week, um, about how the offensive line looks and where it goes from here. But sitting here and now, based on some conversations I've had, I think left guard could be where John Runyon ends up starting. We will see, though. I, I don't know that definitively, but I've had some interesting conversations about that. Doug Analytics says, what were your takeaways of du Duggan's details on the Drew Locke contract incentives? Hey, Doug, good to see you, man. Um, Doug, another huge supporter of the channel. Doug, um, I think, uh, as I was noting earlier, um, you know, to me, it reinforced my reporting and what John Schneider said publicly on the radio in Seattle, the GM of the Seahawks, that Drew Locke came here with an idea that he had a chance to compete to play, right? And so, you know, those incentives are there for a reason. I think Daniel Jones's injury history, like it's always this talk about, do you think Jones is good enough or not? His injury history matters, matters very much. And Doug, my takeaway is it reinforces that this kid, Drew Locke, um, you know, could play a fair amount for the Giants this season. Guess he's not a kid anymore, but you know what I mean? Joseph says, who's the most likely pick at six? I think Adunze. Um, you know, but I think they want to go quarterback. D Kit, my guy, appreciate you. Ten bucks. Looks like D Kit checking in with a question there. Do you have any update on Jones with regard to his knee and neck? Has he been around the building? 
yeah, he has been around the building. Um, I know since the beginning of the off season, he wasn't going elsewhere. He was training here. That's been, um, that's been D kit, what he's been doing this off season. Um, I saw him at the Super Bowl. He was, he said he was still around here. Um, I know he's running on, you know, on the ground now, as opposed to on the, uh, anti-gravity treadmill that I talked to him about that he was using to kind of get back there. Um, you know, Lombardi of course reported that things were behind schedule a little bit ago. Um, I think a lot of signs to how the giants have been handling this and this kind of the secrecy of this all and their aggressive hunt for this next quarterback. You have the injury stuff with Daniel's contract and the guarantees that can kick in. Like, I think a lot of things are pointing towards them not feeling confident in his health um, and hedging. I mean, you know, the expectation that he'll be healthy for week one and be healthy for training camp and all those things. They said the expectation was Martindale and Kafka were going to be back and they nearly lost both of them voluntarily. Right. So, um, you know, hard to take their word on that. All right, let's see. D kit. Thanks as always, man. Huge supporter of the channel. MD says, I have to wonder why the Giants are being so vocal about wanting a QB and specifically saying which ones they like. Wouldn't they want that to stay in-house? MD, uh, the Giants aren't like shouting from the rooftops who they want, right? Like these things come out in various ways from various teams, uh, various people in the league. Um, you know, the Giants certainly don't have a, uh, a billboard up on the turnpike and on the Garden State Parkway saying, here's who we want at quarterback in a trade up with the New England Patriots at three. Um, but I think really it has stemmed from their actions. Like their actions have uh, demonstrated that they are hunting for that guy. And so it wasn't difficult, especially once John Mara spoke, to see how obvious it was that the whole organizational arrow was pointing towards going to get a guy if they could find him, if they identified him and if they could get him. Right. So, you know, those are more than tea leaves. And then when people actually start sharing the information and it starts getting out, it kind of confirms it. Now, again, that could, the draft could still fall a lot of different ways, but that's the best way I could describe it. Joey B comedy back in the house. What's up, boys? I don't really want Drake or McCarthy. I got a feeling they're going to be Daniel Jones 2.0, and we're going to be in the same boat. We need to go get Jaden Daniels somehow if we go QB. Interesting input there, Joey. Appreciate you. Jacob says, second time we had breaking news during a Pat Leonard Live. That's right, Jacob. I'm telling you, man, you never know. You never know. Let's see. Well, we Our last breaking news was the J.J. McCarthy Easter Sunday workout, right? Now we have, uh, you know, validation and confirmation that at least according to a very uh, trusted source in the league that Drake May is the guy for the Giants. Let's see. Appreciate you, Jacob. Joey B says, bring in Flacco or Kaepernick. <laughs> uh, H5000 says, considering Neil, Azudu, and McKeithen have proven nothing so far, how would you rate Sh change drafts as of now? Granted, it's early, but right now, give him a letter grade. Um, I would say Joe Shane's dra drafts have been C minus. Is that is that fair? Is that too harsh? What do you guys think? Um, let me see. New York Giants draft history. Let me just look at it again to give you a definitive letter grade here, at least in our, our live chat. So... Let's see. Kayvon, Evan Neal, Wandale Robinson, Josh Azudu, Cordell Flott, Daniel Bellinger, Dane Belton, Micah McFadden, DJ Davidson, Marcus McKeithen, Darian Beavers, Deontay Banks, John Michael Schmitz, Jalen Hyatt, Eric Gray, Trey Hawkins, Jordan Riley, Javarius Owens. Yeah, C minus. Um, you know, not a lot of guys who you read their name there and you say, oh, yeah, you know, so, you know, um, obvious major hit, right? Now, Flott showed some improvement last year. McFadden contributed, had some missed tackles, though. A um, lot of injury issues with the Giants roster and with that 2022 rookie class initially. Um, you know, last year, of course, some growing pains. John Michael Schmitz, uh, Jalen Hyatt used sparingly, showed some flashes. Eric Gray, uh, a, a true weakness. Trey Hawkins really wasn't able to help the team. 
Jordan Riley uh, came on a little bit late. We'll see. Uh, Javarius Owens didn't contribute much. I mean, cave on double digit sacks, but still wanting more there. Deontay Banks, I think the arrow is pointing up. Evan Neal, of course, um, a huge one that sticks out like a sore thumb. Wandale Robinson, um, not sold, but we'll see. But, you know, uh, maybe Dane Belton can come on and continue to make progress as the ball hawk that he's shown he has been in spurts when he's gotten his opportunities. That, I think, would go a long way to uh, strengthening some of his draft record. But I would say C- minus or so. Um, cute animal videos says, Pat, did the Giants select a quarterback or wide receiver at six? I think quarterback, even though receiver is a likely scenario, if they can't get a trade up, we'll see. George Lewis, what's up, George? George was the one who told us to watch out for a Giants trade up to the Chargers at five. Remember that. Remember George. He's the one. Blunt. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Guts says, Pat, how does signing a young edge rusher to a long-term deal indicate that they're trying to win now? They got a young player that is likely to far outperform, outperform whoever they got with that too. Well, they invested a high second round pick and paid a top of the entire edge rusher market contract for a player to immediately upgrade their pass rush. This was not a let's get a young player in the building and watch him blossom in 2027. This was let's go get a guy who we think can be a big time pass rusher for us now, who also is younger and maybe still has room to grow, right? You're hoping to get both things there. But teams don't make aggressive deals like that. There were edge rushers you could sign in free agency. They expended draft capital and premium money and assets to go and get that player. Guts, that's just that's just a move that a team makes when it's desperate to fill a hole in the roster to upgrade immediately. That is not a, you know, 2026, 2027 move. I mean, it certainly is instilling the roster with a younger guy who hopefully can be a premium player and be a face of the franchise guy as we go along. But that kind of investment in a specific and singular player at a position where you already drafted a guy fifth overall is the kind of move a team makes when it is trying to upgrade its roster now. So, you know, if you disagree with that, I mean, that's really just how that move is seen around the league. And it was frankly seen as a desperately aggressive move by the Giants based on the overpay with money. OG says, Pat, Daniel Jones isn't good. And that's something we all know because we've been watching it for five years. He was a developmental player um, that the, um, he was a developmental player that the Giants got. Gotcha. Salient Smile says, Pat, shouldn't we be looking to trade back and get more picks? We lack wide receiver talent, starting corners, and a questionable O-line. That's a possibility, Salient, especially if they can't get up to get the QB or their quarterback doesn't fall into their lap. Therefore, you know, um, that could be the move. And listen, so Adam Schefter is saying that J.J. McCarthy could go in that 8 to 12 range. What if the Giants tried to find a partner in that realm, trade back and still take J.J.? What if they slid back if McCarthy doesn't go in that top four, top six, and they got him at eight, nine or ten? Right. You obviously need it takes two to tango. Right. So who's trading up to six? Who are they coming up for? Maybe you can't find that partner because everyone is trading up is coming up for a quarterback, right? So maybe that's not a realistic scenario. But I think salient, my point is, if you're Joe Shane and Brian Dable, accruing more draft picks and assets in a trade back is an option. It's something you're looking at as a possibility. I personally don't think it's going to end up being the case based on how the board falls and how some of these guys at top are premium guys. but you know, it depends on how you look at that number 39 pick trade too. Like trading a 39 overall top of second round pick for an edge rusher there. You know, you see the thinking as, um, as Guts outlined earlier, you know, you are getting a young player. Hopefully, you know, you hope it's a much more productive young player than a guy you'd be drafting there if you drafted an edge. But you're also using assets from a draft where you need more capital to reinforce your roster with cost-effective players. 
that's the other point, Guts, going back to that is you could draft a young pass rusher who could be productive and also be on a rookie contract versus paying him a top of the market, top dollar deal. That's why it's more of a win now versus drafting a pass rusher. Let's see. Um, OG says they can't keep trying to draft quarterbacks like Eli Matting. There's only one of them. <laughs> From your lips to God's ears. Uh, Miz says I'm dying for Drake May. Oh, man. There we go. Brett M says, hey, Pat, what's the word on Bryce Ford Wheaton? Um, you know, he was, he was standing on the practice field before the end of the season. He was out there walking around, not practicing, but, um, his rehab was going well. And, um, I would expect him to be a guy who is tracking towards, you know, certainly competing for the wide receiver slash special teams roster spot. He was impressing them as a gunner on punt coverage, um, as well as, you know, at receiver where he's learning, learning the offense, but. Um, he could help them, you know, really good physical body. Now they just signed Miles Boykin, um, a veteran special teamer and wide receiver from uh, the Steelers and Ravens, a guy who was a free agent, fellow uh, Notre Dame guy. So uh, we'll be good to meet you, Miles, in the locker room. But uh, welcome, go Irish. But, um, you know, how does that reflect? Um, you know, we don't have info up to date on Bryce Ford Wheaton, like from – you know, more than coming out of the end of the season. So would Miles Boykin be a guy who's here because Ford Wheaton isn't going to get that spot? That's a possibility. Um, but, you know, he's a young player, Ford Wheaton, who the Giants liked. Felt like watching him there last summer that they had something there possibly, um, even if it was just as a depth uh, guy who could hopefully grow into more. So I'm eager. He's one of the young players in the building I'm eager to see continue to grow, hopefully. MJ says the turnovers were against some of the weakest teams in the NFL. Yeah, no, I'm just saying the Giants won because their defense was turning the ball over at a ridiculous rate. Uh, let's see. Uh, Intel says just draft the damn QB. Why is it so hard to rebuild? OG says you can't rebuild with Daniel Jones as the number one quarterback. Intel says there is only – this is only uh, – it's frustrating being a Giants fan. Yeah, sorry, Intel. I know it is. Jay Stewart says, why is it so hard for the ownership to see when a player is not working out like Daniel Jones, but so easy to cut bait with head coaches? Please explain this dichotomy. Jay Stewart, really insightful point there. Really insightful point. Got We got to pin that bad boy. That is super insightful from Jay Stewart. Jay, I mean, you know, that's a really, really, really good question. The Giants historically, and, you know, I think there's a lot of organizations like this. It's coaches end up usually getting the, the short end of the stick when it comes to the organization, hires the general manager, puts a lot of faith uh, in the GM, lot, give, you know, a lot of resources, a lot of trust, and they give that GM the right and the ability to run their program. And they are – you know, in constant communication with that GM and typically very tied to and patient with the general manager operation, the overall operation. But when it comes to the ground floor, you know, why things aren't working out, often coaches end up coming to blame. Um, you know, I mean, I will die on the hill that if Joe Judge was here with a different general manager when he was the coach, he would still be the Giants head coach today. Um, but you know, that became a situation where, um, you know, you're blowing the whole building up and you're not after that first season doing the right thing, which was to marry him to somebody uh, that, you know, would have created alignment. Now, creating alignment with Joe Shane and Brian Dable ideally prevents you from splitting the baby, let's say. Um, but, um you know, obviously, John Maris said these guys are not tied at the hip. He does not view them as a package deal, which is very interesting. D Kit says, I was late tonight, just heard about the big reveal on Drake May. I hope there aren't leaks in the building. That's not good, Pat. Um, you know, D Kit, I think. Well, here's what I would say, D Kit. Before I report to you guys, hey, someone's texting me, Drake May's the guy, right? 
last chat, what was it, last week, okay, we were having conversations. We were talking about, okay, would it, could the Giants really change their franchise with Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr., uh, Roma Dunze, right? Could they tri- Could they change their franchise with one of those guys? And we got into the conversation about, well, it'll be hard for them to turn the team around. You know, yes, they could be a good weapon. It might not make a big difference in the win total. But we talked about who were the two quarterbacks that really resonated. It seemed like at the time, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, right? Those were the two that we were talking about a week ago. And Drake May versus J.J. could just be a, a standpoint of they like both players, but Drake May is the top six pick who has the upside there and already the high-end skills and some of the tape that makes you say, I can see what it looks like. Whereas McCarthy isn't a player you dislike, but maybe he's a player you like at a different spot, at a lower value, that you see his ceiling is a little bit lower, even though you love the person and you like the player, right? So, you know, I think there's graduations to, um, and kind of a build up to the way that this information kind of steadily trickles. And also the way that the dots start connecting. And um, yes, this is a big Drake May reveal. You know, Ralph Vacchiano, of course, reporting for Fox Sports that he's the guy that the Giants would trade up for if they could. Me hearing similar things, obviously, that he's their guy up there if they could go and get a guy. So now the question becomes, though, is this all a moot point, right? Is this coming out because the Drake may the player is somebody yes, who the giants like, but in the end, here's another thing. This could be getting out from the giants because the giants want people to know this is just a hypothetical. I'm not saying this is what's happening, but this could get out from the giants because the giants may really in the end, they want people to know here's the guy we like and we can't get him, Right. So if they don't draft a quarterback there, if they don't draft a quarterback in the first round, if they don't draft a quarterback high, if they don't draft a quarterback at all, it's on the record that we wanted to. And here he is. And here's the guy we like. Here's the guy we love. Here's the guy we tried to trade up for. Here's the guy we called the Patriots and the Cardinals about. Couldn't get him, right? That's all. That's also possible. Those things happen, right? Smoke screens or for the purposes of that would be like essentially a public relations move, right? Those things happen too. Or in the end, sometimes it is what it is. And I hate that phrase. I really do. But what I mean when I say that here is sometimes interest in a player and desire for a player is just that, right? So man, this is, I'll tell you what, guys, this has been, this is the, the buildup for this draft feels like as big as anyone I've ever covered. And I know we were going into the Daniel Jones draft. It was the quarterback. They had the number two overall pick. They take Saquon Barkley. I mean, the Giants have had a lot of high draft picks while I've been covering the team. So it's always a busy season for me. But this one with the amount of quarterbacks, the amount of revolving doors and the amount of talking points, I mean, you know. It's been great for these conversations. It really has. All right. Let me get back into the queue. Jay Stewart, really, really insightful point, though. Back to you. John P says, fair points and quarterback incentives, but these are obviously selling points, obvious selling points. Daniel Jones has been hurt, so why would you not leverage that possibility to bring in a decent backup? Yes. No, true. From a business standpoint, from the Giants standpoint, um, that is a selling point to getting somebody in the building. Although the Giants said they didn't sell them on that point, right? This is the thing, I, this is what I'm saying too. This is the idea that, well, we didn't sell him on the idea that he was actually going to play. Well, I mean, you can't have it both ways. Looks like you might've, right? But John P, good point about like the business of it from the Giants end. Joe says, Shane made a mistake on the Jones contract. I agree. With his neck injury history, it might be to their advantage not to let him play another down. Otherwise the injury guarantee kicks in. Intuition says, how high is the probability of the trade? Uh, takes, a, takes a partner to do the trade. 
Um, that's, that's hard to say intuition. I think, uh, my intuition says that they're trying and it's going to be difficult. We'll see if they pull it off. Sorry. I can't give you a better answer than that, but it's hard for me to handicap that. Um, the prices are high, you know, the prices are high. I think like one of our, uh, loyal followers said earlier, it's more likely that they make a trade to five or four than they would get to three. But then again, if you don't get to three, do you get Drake may that's the, you know, Brett says everyone forgot the talk of how many teams would have liked to have Jones if the Giants weren't going to pay him during the start of the playoffs. Right. But where was that coming from, Brett? That's the question. Where was that coming from? Because in the end, Brett, they were negotiating against themselves with that contract. Like he wasn't going to get that contract on the open market. Joe says, I doubt the Giants trade up. Shane won't pay the price in future draft picks. We'll see. OG says, I'll call it now 6-11 and 11 this season. I think seven wins, probably the ceiling for the Giants this year. That's my view. 6-11, um, and 11, I believe, was my early prediction for their record. Uh, I could see it coming in lower as well. Hope not. Brett says, I like when someone compared him to dang Patrick Mahomes. I seen it and saw it. Jacob says, are you going live on draft night, Pat? Still still uh, some plans in the works there. I'll let you guys know. Um, obviously, a lot of momentum for you guys um, for me to do that. So I just have to figure out the best way to do it. Obed says, QB or bust? Obed says, you are not getting Roma Dunze and Michael Penix Jr. Can we please put that to bed? It's not happening. Why? Why? Brett says a billion dollars says we won't get a quarterback with the first pick. Wow. Okay. I'm over the QB talk at six every day. Draft needs to hurry. Well, Brett, I mean, it's, you know, that's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of people who don't feel the same way you do. I mean that, you know, I was telling someone today what I'm so interested about in this draft process, especially by doing these, I think it's been a really valuable lesson for me. And also like just a learning experience is I feel like a lot of times, guys, you tell me if this is true or not. A lot of times when we go into these pre-draft processes, eventually it feels like there a consensus starts to build among fans of where the right direction is for their team to go. Right. And here I don't feel like that's the case. I feel like this year it's pretty polarizing on whether to go QB or not. Um, and that, I think that's indicative again, like I said, it's between a rock and a hard place. It's like there's opportunity for the giants. So it's a positive that they maybe can get a QB, maybe you can get a receiver, right? Maybe you can get an offensive lineman there, all players who ideally could help you, but it's also a, wow, we really need to address all these things, but we can't do them all at once. What's the best thing for us? What's the best thing for our team? Uh, what's best for job security, as we were talking about earlier, what's the best way to show that I'm the guy as the coach, as the quarterback, as a GM, whatever. So, uh, OG says Michael Penix Jr. is not getting past the Raiders. Yeah, that's possible. That's possible. Jacob says Drake May is Pat source. <laughs> yeah, right. Drake May's calling, uh, Every uh, a reporter in every market and telling them that their team wants him and he's their guy. Uh, Brett, that was a joke, by the way. Obviously, Brett says if you're not fixing the line, nothing matters. Possible they still haven't fixed it. Jacob says, Pat, what made you want to go into this field? Man, I've wanted to do this since I was uh, since I can remember. Um, Went to uh, Holy Ghost in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. I uh, was the editor of the newspaper there. Played uh, basketball, soccer. So, um, you know, an amateur athlete, let's say. A guy who always loves sports and um, found a passion in writing and also a knowledge and passion for and of sports. And just combined the two. Figured, looked to me like people worked hard when they became adults. And no matter what they did, they had to work a lot and they had to do it a lot. So I just figured I might as well try and do something that I enjoy and that I'm passionate about and that I would be doing anyway and not be getting paid for if it weren't my job. So that's how it started. Um, you know, 
was the managing editor at the student newspaper at Notre Dame, The Observer. Uh, really enjoyed that. Covered men's basketball, football, Charlie Weiss, Tyron Willingham, Mike Bray. Uh, you know, geez, who do we have there? Uh, that was the Brady Quinn, Jeff Samarja, Maurice Stovall, Justin Tuck, uh, John Carlson, you know, those teams. Um, and then, you know, got a break at the Inquirer in Philadelphia, worked my way through there, covering high schools, helping out with colleges, pro practices, that kind of thing. Just really had a passion for it. Always wanted to do it. Um, Gary Smith, a big, uh, you know, somebody I admire from Sports Illustrated. I grew up reading, um, you know, reading the Ernest Hemingways of the world and admiring kind of that, that writing style. And, um, you know, coming, kind of coming up in the business and realizing also, and this is kind of the final piece of it, I would say, Jacob, is writing is how I got in it. But I've learned to love and embrace and improve at the elements of, you know, the television, the reporting, the versatility element of it. Like the idea that social media, right, being present in all these places being able to manage different fronts, multitasking, relationship building, right? Sourcing, um, all while trying to tell these great stories, build connections. Um, it's something that I think my passion allows me to be um, active on in a, during it on a daily basis. Hope that answers your question. Jose Larin says, my first time joining the live. Love it. Thank you, Jose. Appreciate you. Um, you know, drop a, drop a Dolphins question in the chat, drop a, drop a Raiders question in the chat, drop a Giants question, NFL, whatever it is, you let me know. Drinking from my Estate 98 Tumblr here, Essencia Day Cafe from El Salvador, dates back to 1798. Check it out. You can buy it on TikTok shop, Instagram, uh, their website as well, uh, Estate 98. And, uh, we're also sponsored here by Bet Online. Looks like we got another super sticker down here. D Kit, again, checking in. Thanks, D Kit. I get it, Pat, but I struggle to see any real benefit. In fact, I only see negatives in accurate info getting out or info pandering to public perception. Yeah, no, D Kit, I hear you. I hear you. You said, well, especially D Kit, I think where you're coming from as well is like if there's a player you want, you don't want people knowing you want them, right? Um, that was something like I, I listened to Colin Cowherd. He's another person that, you know, grew up really, especially like in college, I feel like he was when he either had gotten big or was starting to get bigger maybe. And um, somebody who like, I, I just think is really a good listen and entertaining. And, um, you know, he was talking about the Minnesota Vikings and JJ McCarthy and how it's so strange that they are tied so directly and strongly to him and that it's hard for him to believe that the Vikings would allow it to get out there that obviously when they're picking at 11, that they love this quarterback, J.J. McCarthy, that he just feels like it's too obvious and fishy that that would get out. So maybe there are reasons why this information is, is sneaking out. And maybe it doesn't have to do with the Giants letting it out of their building, so to speak. Maybe there are other ways that this gets out, right? John P says, feels like to me, 85% plus the Giants stick and pick at six. What's your percentage there? Uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's fair, John. Um, I still like, listen, I want everybody to know, like, I think they're trying to move up for a quarterback and it sounds, you know, it sounds obviously like based on my information and obviously Ralph's reporting and, you know, it sounds like Drake May's the guy, um, but I think the board is going to be tough to navigate. So that's why a trade back is even a possibility, but why picking at six is probably the most likely scenario, John, especially because there's, there's really good players available there. If you don't get up to your quarterback is the thing. It's not like, well, what do we do here? Right? Like it's not one of those drafts. Uh, let's see. D kit. You caught up Hirsch. What's good, man. Good to see you. Jacob says, I feel like because of the generational talent in first 10 to 11 guys, you're going to have to overpay. Yeah, I agree. Scott Young does not want to give up future picks. Intuition says, what are the probabilities of the trade-up? Yeah, hard to say. Uh, but I think, 
like I, I agreed, you know, intuition, probably a good way to answer your question is how John P put it, which is like 85% plus the Giants stick and pick at six. Like, you know, based on factors outside of their control, maybe it's a stronger possibility like that. Like maybe that answers your question. Jonathan says, I can't lie. Sometimes these sessions get me depressed. Not by any of your doing, Pat. Oh, Jonathan, I'm sorry, man. I'm really sorry. I hope that's not the case. Um, let's see. What would make you feel better? Um, well, here's what make you feel better. Trevor Sikama and I, we did our pro football focus mock draft. Um, you know, giant seven round mock, six picks. And we came away with two new weapons for the Giants offense in that draft, plus filling holes um, around the roster. Not going to give away too much, but uh, I do think, Jonathan, going through that exercise with Trevor, it became clear to me that I think the fan base is going to be excited about the Giants' ability to address some of these positions of need, even if it's not high, you know, receiver, running back, tight end, corner, defensive tackle, offensive line, safety, right? These are all positions you're looking at. You need to draft some players at. You need some depth. You need some high-end talent even. So um, hope to bring a smile to your face that when I went through that exercise, now listen, those late picks end up being flyers. Um, but we even looked at, you know, with the new kickoff rule, are you taking a flyer maybe in the late round on a guy who's got a, um, you know, has like rocket boosters attached to his feet, right? Is that something you look at, even though you have an Isaiah McKenzie and a Gunnar Olszewski, right? Are you looking at a player like that? I don't know. Check out the mock draft tomorrow. That'll be on the podcast and on the Daily News uh, website. Um, G-Men says, if we trade up for May, who has serious bust potential, that would be horrendous. Scott says, hey, Pat, enjoy your interview with Adam. Good stuff. Thank you so much for saying that, Scott. Really appreciate it. Miz says Yankees win the the Yankees win 10 and 2 dominant. Anthony Volpe, man, is he still leading the league in hitting? Is Volpe still leading the league in hitting? I think he was at 417 before today's game. Give it, give me some, give me some updates there. Jonathan says they need to draft Estime out of Notre Dame, not the perfect guy. Or he is he not the perfect guy to compliment Singletary? Definitely a physical downhill guy for sure. Uh, that is the type of mold. Not sure it would be him, but, um, you know, definitely churned out the yards at ND. And that is, Jonathan, when I was alluding to the type of early down physical back that is, you know, in that mold for sure. Miz says, I said Drake will be, Drake May will be a giant back in December. People thought I was crazy. Watch the Miz. Watch the Miz. I'm liking that comment. Yeah, baby. Love it. Hirsch says, quarterback just makes too much sense not to pass up. Brett says, so for five years, our number one quarterback hasn't had anything close to a number one wide receiver, but he needs to go. Uh, I think it's more complicated than just that. But Brett, obviously, that is a fair point, especially when you look at the fact that last year, Joe Shane's solution was trading for Darren Waller. And now look where that stands. Jonathan Ryan says they should have traded for <coughs> Lejarius Sneed instead of the Brian Burns. Big impact and a little cheaper. What do you say? Jonathan, word on the street about Snead is that he's got uh, a knee that could become a problem down the road that was scaring some people. Um, so that's why maybe like the long-term investment and the aggressive trade for him wasn't happening all over the place. Though obviously the Titans felt comfortable with it, but that'll be an interesting one to watch. That that was what I heard. Uh, Scott liked Justin Pugh's leadership. So did I. And they need some nasty on that line too. Uh, let's see. Scott says, do you think the Giants will be looking at running backs maybe in the later rounds? Yes. In fact, we took one in a later round in my seven round mock coming out tomorrow on the daily news and on this channel. John P says, any insight on top 30 visits for second tier quarterbacks? That to me is more noteworthy on what they are planning on doing. They have to do their homework on the top quarterbacks. Uh, nothing specific. Uh, I know you guys, some of you are distressed that there may be leaks coming out, but um, no, like it is not getting around uh, every guy that they're bringing into the building. Um, it is certainly not leaking out, at least not in a, an immediate timely fashion. Um, so no, I, I, John, I don't have any insight on that right now, um, but they've been doing um, a lot of work um, on the quarterbacks 
um, throughout the draft. It wouldn't surprise me um, if even through the pro days, you know, they were getting some of those things done as well, uh, as far as like closer meetings with some of those quarterbacks. All right, let's see. Brad M says we did draft a running back, Dante Miller. Um, okay, so you're talking about them signing the former South Carolina running back. Yeah, I mean, this is a guy who played at Columbia, had one year at South Carolina, um, had I think his best college season. He had 809 rushing yards and four touchdowns, and he's five nine and two hundred. At least that's what he was listed at in college. So, uh, listen. I, I know the kid's got a great story. I hope he does well. Um, I hope he helps the Giants, but that looks like a flyer. That looks like a bring the guy in on this during the spring and see what he's got type signing. Um, the production isn't there to say that, you know, oh, hey, home run. We got our running back. Like the home, it's not there. Tuto says massive salutes and respects to big boss Pat and all diehard Giants fans in the building. Greetings from me. And my fam in Princeton, God's blessings to everyone. Tuto still holding it down in Princeton, still supporting the channel. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Tuto always bringing it. Um, I see you guys rolling in late. Sorry, I got to stay in the queue here. We are talking. If, if you are not caught up, um, source texted me today, said they heard that Drake May is the guy. Um, that reinforces what Ralph Facchiano reported for Fox Sports, that he's the quarterback the Giants would trade up for if they could. But they might not be able to get there. Uh, could be a moot, moot point. Also, it doesn't mean they don't like other guys um, at different spots. And, of course, we've been talking a little bit about why would this information be coming out? Where do these leaks come from? Some people distressed by the fact that it would be leaked. Some people excited that the Giants would go up and get him. Some people distressed that Joe Shane would give up the kind of assets it would take to do that. And also some people who feel like it just wouldn't be worth it. Right. But then there's the dominoes that fall as far as how does that impact Brian Dable's job security? And is it positive? Um, as we, as we discussed earlier, I think it was MJ who noted maybe Brian Dable shows development with a, with a young quarterback that he has drafted. And then that buys him time and sets the team on a better course. Those things obviously all possible. Um, so that's where that's where we're at. Um, let's see. I'm going to try to get through the rest of this queue. Um, but Brett, thanks for mentioning Dante Miller. Um, that is obviously a player that they've added. Eric says the right side of the offensive line is question marks. Yes, it is. Malik Neighbors would be Juan Soto to our offense. Eric, I love that comparison. That's a good one. I like that. I'm going to use that. I'll, I'll give you credit, though. Giants need two wide receivers. Yeah, it wouldn't hurt. Uh, MD says, uh, that makes sense. Jackson says, hey, Pat, do you think Neighbors or Adunze fits the Giants' offense more? <sighs> That's tough. Um, to be honest, I would not be forcing a pick based on the fit in Brian Dable's offense as much as which guy's more explosive and creates more big plays and touchdowns. That's what I would say. Both guys do. Um, Adunze is more the, you know, the bigger body physical guy. Uh, Neighbors is, um, I think, like, who who was it who said to me that he plays with a jet pack on his back? Or did I, did I, did Matt Miller say that on Jordan's podcast? I think he, I heard him say that. Uh, but various versions of that, like rocket boosters, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, I think it would be neighbors just based on his explosiveness if they were both still on the board at six, but I don't know that for sure. Um, Jackson thinks my C minus grade for Joe Shane's drafts is fair. Brett thinks it's a C plus um, and that his off season acquisitions are a D minus. Yeah, no, not that. That's the sneaky part. The quiet part out loud is just the player acquisitions haven't been good, you know? Uh, let's see. Neil believes supporting the channel. Thank you, Neil. Neil says Daniel Jones has had areas of opportunity that hindered him from overcoming less than ideal situations. 
He hesitated to throw the ball, didn't push the ball downfield. Plus, he has reoccurring next neck issues. Yeah, Neil, and you know what? I, I, I bring this up every now and then. Last season, when the offensive line let him down, obviously, and really it was the construction of the offensive line. It was just a poorly conceived offensive plan and roster plan, and they couldn't keep guys hurt, right, or keep, couldn't keep guys healthy. And I, like, if you go back and look at my coverage last season of Daniel, especially early, I wouldn't say I was giving him a pass for losing games and a few missed throws here and there, but really the story to me was not Daniel Jones isn't any good. It was like, what is, what is this team? What is the assembly of this offensive line? They don't even have a chance to operate, right? That's where I stood. But, and especially after the Seattle game where they had a chance and he made some key mistakes, especially that pick six, I would say this, Daniel was harsher on himself than I was on him. Like Daniel Jones was the one who came out and said, like, essentially stop making excuses for me. I'm not playing well enough. And I know that, you know, as a leader, it's like, okay, that's what he has to say. Right. Um, those types of things, but you know, um, sorry, I just got stuck in the queue here for a second. But I, you know, I really think that Jones meant it. Like, I think he was really genuinely saying that he was acknowledging his play wasn't good enough, regardless of everything around it. And so I do keep coming back to that because I feel like his, his Daniel's objective valuation of his play from my vantage point, knowing him was that he wasn't playing well enough, regardless. All right. Coming down the home stretch here, I will get to everyone's question. Thank you for participating in this Talking Ball Live with Pat Leonard. Just so you guys know, schedule-wise, I'm going to be away for a few days into the middle of next week. So we're going to skip later this week, and we're not going to have one next Monday. But I'm going to come back raring to go on Thursday, April 18th. I'll have uh, some more podcasts dropping here. Uh, some more content in the daily news. And I'll still be working the phones while I'm away. Like if anything big comes down, if a trade happens, anything like that, like I'll be, I'll be around. You'll, you'll hear from me on Twitter, P Leonard, N Y D N on X P L on NFL, everywhere else, IG, TikTok, Insta, uh, Instagram, YouTube threads, etc. But after this chat tonight on the ninth, we will not have another live chat until the 18th, but then it's going to ramp up. We'll have the 18th. That's Thursday, April 18th, 9 p.m. We'll have a live chat that night. And then going into the next week, that's draft week. And so we'll be going on Monday night, the 22nd. And we will have uh, some draft plans in the works. Again, still working out exactly that what that's going to look like. But obviously, you guys want to keep this rolling into and through draft weekend. And I'm well aware of that. And I appreciate you guys uh, for pushing me to do more in that regard. So hopefully we can get something that works for everybody. All right, let's get back into the queue here. Um, Steven says, I have some concerns with the GM, particularly with quarterback situation of paying and then quickly pivoting, trading for an often, often injured tight end, seeming to get a miss with Neil. What do you think, Pat? Shades of Dave Gettleman? I mean – some of Gettleman's uh, investments and really the way that he spoke about his process or lack thereof, I think was a whole different level of incompetence. I mean, I, I always say this about Joe Shane, like even some of his misses, like I do like his process in a lot of ways. And I think his process is sound and thought out a lot of the times, but I just think the player evaluations miss in a lot of these cases, whether it's free agent signings or draft picks or, you know, and I, like I said, the failure to keep players healthy is a big issue here too. Um, but, you know, Gettleman, I think, was missing or making bad decisions without any process behind it to explain it half the time, or, or at least an up-to-date, sound, reasonable, well-thought-out process um, that made sense to people if you said it to 10 people in a room around a table. Whereas Shane, he can make a mistake, but still explain to you how he got to that decision and you can nod your head and see how he got there, even if he picked the wrong player, if that if that makes sense. But obviously, 
Stephen, it doesn't matter if you pick the wrong player or if the player doesn't work out, right? Because that's what you're paid to do is make those decisions and hit. Uh, Jackson says, do you view this as a make or break draft for Shane? It's possible, Jackson. I think it's more likely that this is a make or break season for the coach and not the GM. But the decision to let Saquon walk to the Eagles and the possible pressure that puts on you if things go wrong, who knows? You know, um, I don't know the answer to that. I definitely think that it's something not to ignore. And that's why I asked Adam Schefter in my interview on my Talking Ball with Pat Leonard podcast this week, which you can watch if you haven't seen it yet um, on the channel. But I asked Schefter if, you know, if that would put more pressure on the GM and coach if that went down that way. And Schefter said, not overtly, but maybe subtly, like behind the scenes for sure, because it certainly wouldn't look good and wouldn't reflect well if you let him walk to the Eagles and they do damage and they have a big season and Saquon has a big year and the Giants fall flat on their face. Like that's now I know that's a worst case scenario. It could happen the other way, right? The optimist, uh, the glass half full would be uh, Saquon. Hopefully, knock on wood, stays healthy. Just hope that for every player. But <clears throat> that the Eagles can't get out of their own way like they couldn't late in the season last year. That losing Jason Kelsey and Fletcher Cox, um, you know, really damages their ability to be the high-level team that they've been in the past, that they don't necessarily have the same leadership, and that they're not otherworldly, and that the Giants have enough weapons on their offense to make up for the loss of Barkley. That, from a Giants angle, would be the outlook. But – you know, the fact of the matter is they lost a lot of their touchdowns when they let Saquon go to Philly. So they're missing a lot of touchdowns on this roster. Brett says offseason acquisitions D minus. That's right. Uh, D kit says I've thrown in the towel in the Giants drafting Michael Penix Jr. Does not mean I wish they would. Uh, I do believe May or JJ will be a giant. As for Shane's draft grade, I would give it a solid C. Eric says, I don't like the right side of the line because if Neil plays badly, he goes to right guard, Illuminor goes to right tackle, but right guard would be a hole. Neil has no place. He's a big question mark. Uh, you could easily make the argument that this offensive line, either in week one or quickly, would have Illuminor, Stinney, and John Runyon Jr. all starting and Evan Neal not in the starting lineup. The O-line is terrible. Yes, it has been. Steven says, no one was mad with Neil and Thibodeau when we drafted, and last year's first three rounds was something we'd all sign up for. Has it worked fully? Obviously not, but very Monday morning quarterback to judge them now. I don't necessarily think it's Monday morning quarterback to judge them now. Like I think I think 2022's draft, um, you know, miss like missing on Evan Neal is a big deal. And yes, you're right that it's not like anybody thought he was being overdrafted there, but clearly they missed up. They missed on the makeup of the player there. Um, you know, I mean, you look at those top five picks in that draft, Kayvon, Evan Neal, Wandale Robinson, Azudu, Cordell Flott. Um, you've got two guys right now who look like busts. One guy who might become a weapon uh, one corner who is on the developmental curve, hopefully uh, producing for you at a high level this year, and a defensive end who's had some production but is also a bit of an enigma and an incomplete player and who you just paid somebody $28 million a year um, on a contract extension and traded for with a second-round pick at the same position. Um, so, I, Stephen, I, I don't know. I, don't, I disagree that it's Monday morning quarterback. I think, you know – I agree with you last year. Like for I think it would Monday be Monday morning quarterback to be all over John Michael Schmitz right now, let's say, because the guy did just play one rookie season with a lot of pressure on him and he didn't play up to snuff. He owned it. But you know, now you go into year two, you see how you acclimate, you see how you adjust. It's the NFL schedule, you're not used to all those things. Now he is an older player, got more experience that you were hoping would hit the ground running a little bit better. But you know, yeah, no, I agree. You got like last year, Deontay Banks, John Michael Schmitz, Jalen Hyatt. Those are guys still on a develop, like on a on a on an upward curve. You're hoping um, Hyatt hope you hope he continues to blossom. 
Banks, I think, showed some really good flashes. I like him. And Schmitz could very well bounce back, right? Very well bounce back. So, yes, I, I think it's very Monday morning quarterback to, to immediately grade a roster after one season, especially when guys have been up and down and maybe just like, you know, they weren't out of this world great. Of course, yeah, that happens with every rookie. I do not, however, think it's Monday morning quarterback to judge the 2022 class. Eric says Giants need to steal Tyler Guyton, pick 47, and Christian Haynes at pick 70, or Zach Zinter in round four. Mustan says, was Shane's comment for Sports Illustrated real? Well, uh, which comment? Are you talking about Albert Breer writing about the Giants? And what exactly, which comment are you referring to, Mustan? Let me know. Steven says, GM, like everyone else, judge on results, are judged on results. Yeah, they tend to get longer leashes with the Giants and, and, and with a lot of programs too, not just the Giants. Eric says, I don't like Neil's work ethic. I have no idea why Joe is still holding on to faith. We'll see. It is a big offseason for Evan. Jackson says, I saw you and Adam Schefter talk about Dable Shane being on the hot seat. How many games do the Giants have to win? Great question, Jackson. Well, I think it needs to look at, like a competent program. I mean, you can't have like half of the coaching staff running for the hills, other guys getting fired, um, guys being kept on the staff that would have left otherwise because it's a nightmare. I mean, like this, you know, like that it doesn't matter how many games. Like if you if you're not winning, if you're not a winning team and those things are coming up, right? Like that's just a recipe for disaster. Jackson, I don't know exactly. I mean, I think I think that a bad start, like a bad start could send this in the wrong direction very quickly and could lead to a mid-season type deal, even though that's not something the Giants like to do. Um, but with Mike Kafka kept in the building, made assistant head coach, um, you know, who knows? Um, you know, I think though there's a lot of pressure, not only for them to win games, but to win early and to show some belief and ability to stop the bleeding of this program, uh, right away. Lewis says JJ and Drake don't believe the hype Flava Flav. Jackson says, wish we could draft May and have him sit a year. Ideally, that's what the Giants would love to do is draft a quarterback and develop them like the Green Bay way. But we all know in New York, you draft a guy six overall, it's tough to do that. Especially the guys in front of you aren't obviously better than you. Um, you know, who knows? I, but, you know, who knows what that looks like when the practices start, if you draft a player at six, how that's going to look. Um, Jake May is not a guy you're drafting and playing in week one. Um, at least that's not how he profiles. That's not what people view him as necessarily. But who knows? It's New York. It's Daniel Jones injury history. We'll see, maybe it's draft Drake May at six, or maybe it's trade up draft Drake May, start Drew Locke at the start of the season, Daniel's not ready, and then put the rookie in behind Drew Locke. Eric says, please, Pat Leonard, don't announce the draft pick before the commissioner. <laughs> That's right. Brad says, the Philip Rivers curse. Uh, Jackson says, how are we in the draft with the Giants address the secondary? Um, could be second or third round. Um, you know, I personally think like – like if we go by Adam Schefter's, you know, spitballing about how it could go, maybe it looks like um, wide receiver slash tackle in the first round, quarterback in the late first, early second, corner in the third, right? That could be it. Though I think a lot of people feel like some of the really good corners are going to be there in the second round and then won't be there in the third. So maybe the second round is that spot. We'll see. Eric says, we want to see Tim McDonald pick his brain. Pat, he's been behind the scenes. Oh, you want to see Tim McDonald pick his brains. Uh, he's been behind the scenes. Yeah, Tim. No, Tim's a big part of this process, big part of the evaluation process for the Giants. Lewis says, this isn't a video game. Joe Shane messed up. We're stuck with DJ till next year. Brett says, I would take Drake May if I had to choose, but we're getting a wide receiver one. Jackson says, I don't see McCarthy's ceiling being that much higher than Daniel Jones. Lewis says, first we get a quarterback from Duke, and now Carolina, the Knicks already have a point guard. <laughs> Jackson says, I know it's early, but the 2025 QB class definitely looks weaker than this year's class. What options would be the Giants at QB next year? No, it's much weaker. Um, Shadur Sanders in next year's class. Um, 
a couple other names, but um, you know, this is the this is the class the Giants have eyed. This is the class that they told John Mara about how much they thought of it. Um, hard to run from those comments. BBU says nobody wanted Daniel Jones last year. Little Bulldozer says, please no Drake May. Lewis says Giants win four or five games. Uh, little Bulldozer doesn't want JJ or Drake May. Lewis says if the Giants pick a quarterback at six, Joe Shane will be fired in two years. Steven says, I think if we had a top three pick, everyone would be more on board with the QB pick. You know, Steven, I think that's a really good point. I'm glad you said that. Um, I, I think what, what Steven means here too is like, I think a lot of, for a lot of people, it's hard to get on board with the quarterback pick because they don't want to expend assets because they know the team still need, has a lot of needs. Um, and, but I think Steven brings up a good point. Steven brings up the point, like if you're somebody who doesn't feel like the quarterback's the answer here, if the Giants had the second or third pick and they were going QB, would you be cool with it? Or would you say, no, get Daniel Jones slash Drew Locke a receiver or Marvin Harrison Jr. or a top tackle, right? I think Steven makes a good point here. And the point is, like, listen, if you think enough of a guy to draft at six, you draft him at, or, you know, you draft him at two, you know? Um, and if you have a need at quarterback, you have a need at quarterback. And if you're in that market and you're hunting those top QBs, you're doing it. Like, that's what you're doing. So, um, Steven, I think that's an excellent, excellent, excellent point. And I agree with you. Lewis says, no more quarterbacks out of basketball schools, no game managers. Um, Okay. BBU says everyone should be on board with a QB. Michael says Giants can reasonably win 10 plus games next season given given their scheduled opponents. The 2024 strength of schedule is predicated on their 2023 record. Michael, it does profile as a slightly easier schedule uh, than last year, but 10 plus games, I mean, really you have to have some success in your division to do that. And the Giants still have to prove they can do that in their division. Not saying that's not that's not possible, but they haven't had a good track record recently of doing that. So that's something to keep an eye out for, uh, Michael. I think as much as you're looking at the uh, the rest of their schedule, some of those teams are improving, um, but also the Giants are one of these bottom feeding teams too. They're not a good team playing bad teams if the schedule's weaker. They're a bad team playing bad teams. So those games go 50-50, really. So I think it comes down to you got to have some respectable outcomes over the long haul against the Eagles and Cowboys and Commanders as a as a total package and division. And if you do that, you give yourself a chance to do what you're saying, Michael. But that's a real big reason, I think we can all agree, why the Giants haven't been able um, to, to get to that is that they haven't won games in their division. All right. Pat says, or Jonathan says, Pat, looking for the Giants to sign a rugby player who started to return kickoffs on the new play, and they covertly signed Dante Little Turbo Miller. I thought you had us covered. How'd the Giants keep this under wraps? <laughs> I mean, Miller, uh, you think he's the guy? You think he's the uh you think he's the new kickoff guy? Is that is that your uh, impression? I mean, I don't know. We'll see, but that's funny. Hey, maybe, maybe that is, maybe that is the player that they signed for that purpose that you were talking about before. I'll like that comment, Jonathan, you've been on it. Brett says, thanks, Pat. This is cleansing neighbors or Dunze. Brolo says Dante Miller, any potential he could be useful for special teams or even part of a committee. Yeah, we'll see. Brolo, I view that as a, you know, a player that they liked in a previous draft and they have a need at the position. So at a low cost, you bring him in and see what he can do in the spring. That's 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 that type of decision and process. And again, that's what I talk about when I say that I like Joe Shane's process a lot of the times. Like that's good process. You know, if it doesn't cost you a lot, see see what it looks like. D Kit says, so Pat, can you imagine talking ball chats after the draft? You better wear a helmet. <laughs> Jake says. 
Would neighbors' comments regarding the quarterback play of the Giants be a red flag for Shane and Dable? Um, you know what, Jake? I, I could be wrong about this. I was kind of reading that as like him answering the question. And, you know, Josina does great work. Um, friend of the show. She's been on her podcast a couple of times. Her question was like, you know, how do you feel about New York with their quarterback situation being up in the air? So neighbors said, yeah, you know, we, like he's, we'd see about New York. I don't know what they're going to do at quarterback, this and that. I, I felt like he was regurgitating the premise of the question and kind of saying like, don't know where that would go, but yeah, like you'd want that figured out. Like I, I'm not, I don't know. I, I didn't, I didn't interpret that as him saying like they don't have a good quarterback. Um, I could be wrong, but that, that wasn't how I read into that, honestly. Jackson says, has the organization moved on from Daniel Jones? Uh, no, not completely, but they have, they are greasing the, they are laying the track to do so. D kit says Sneed equals possible arthritic knee pass. Yeah. Jackson says sneaky deep, sneaky deep running back class. Yep. Get me Trey Benson out of FSU, a three down starting back. That will be a star says Lewis. D kid says, Pat, do you know when the Penix visit is? Do you know whether they are doing a private workout with him? Um, no, not at the moment. D kit. I got to get on that though. It's pretty deep in this process here. So, um, those things would be happening right now. Um, if they had something more happening there, um, I know they spent extensive time with him when they went to Washington though, but I don't have the answer to that right now. John P says, just your guess, curious how much you think the hundred year anniversary might influence John Mara's reach. Oh, I think it matters in a, a significant amount, John. I think that's a really good point. Yeah, Chris saw you jump in late. That was uh, me, me alluding to like trying to catch people up. Uh, thanks for jumping in. Doesn't matter if you come on time uh, to the chat or if you jump in late and uh, catch the end and watch the replay when we post it on YouTube. But appreciate all your support always, Chris. Um, always contributing a lot. Tudo saying saying hi to all the fans and being the mayor of the chat as always. Down in Princeton, our guy Tudo, appreciate you. BBU says, Daniel Jones can't throw to the receivers we have for him now, but fans think a wide receiver one will make him do a complete 180 in his development after five mediocre years, and we have got him receivers every year. Yeah, that's an ongoing debate. I mean, you know, he definitely never had the benefit of like an Odell Beckham type player or receiver, that's for sure. Pat, do you think we get a Dunze and Penix, says Mike? Mike, that is the type of scenario I envisioned when Adam Schefter was talking about receiver possibly at six and quarterback in the next pick. Uh, let's see. Doesn't seem possible to do 28 reps in the bench press wearing 200 pounds and run a 4-2-7 in the 40. I hope teams jump the Giants at six to save them from themselves for a quarterback, says Lewis. Um. Between Neighbors and Adunze, it's Mike Evans and Odell again, says Omar. Ooh, that would be something. Let's see. Shane D minus, says Lou. Uh, let's see. D Kit says the whole Dable QB whisperer thing is yet to be determined. I'm hopeful, but I don't know how much is him or how much is, for instance, Kafka or Tierney. Isn't settled in my mind. Outside of Josh Allen, we're still waiting for another like big time. Uh, star quarterback to rise and develop from by Brian Dable's tutelage. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Josh Allen is now the best quarter, one of the best quarterbacks in the league. Um, so certainly, let's see. Big Dash, what's up, Big Dash? He says Pat started something with the Shefty interview. Appreciate you, Big Dash. Um, let's see. Bill Hartnett in the house. What's going on, fellas? Man, Giants fans interacting. Yep, talking in the chat, sharing. Bill Hartnett just doing Popeyes for dinner and watching the show. I had some Chick-fil-A tonight. Went down easy. Appreciate that. Yep. Let's see. All the heavy hitters. Chris Peace is here. Bill Hartnett's here. Tuto is here. Big Dash is here. The diehards all in the chat. MJ brought it tonight. Memo brought it. Chris brought it. 
Um, you know, we have our day oneers, Doug Analytics, Antonio, Candyman, Jacob, uh, Hunter, Savage Steve. You know, I'm trying not to leave out anybody, but you guys have been bringing it, um, really driving this chat. Appreciate you. Let's see. Um, R. Lewis says, late to the party and on delay, but no Drake May. Oh, love it. This guy's got rhymes. I would rather trade back with Minnesota and get pick 11 and 23, get Penix in a starting corner with those picks, in my opinion. That'd be interesting, R. Lewis. That'd be interesting. I think Joe Shane's open to everything right now, but I do think quarterback is what they're looking at. Um. Lewis says, no Monday morning quarterback here. Every bad move I call. <laughs> May and Daniels are the biggest boom and bust guys in the draft, says Big Dash. Yeah, Dan Daniels is a really interesting player, right, Big Dash? Because like, he's, man, can he fly when he gets out into the open field. Um, guys don't win Heisman trophies without being blockbuster players. Um, but, you know, how does he translate? Does he throw a strong enough ball down the field? Um, you know, to play at a place, let's say like New York, uh, like New England, uh, maybe Washington a little bit different, but you know, with that frame runs a lot, um, it's going to take some hits, you know, what's that going to look like? Um, does Washington that's, you know, like Cowherd, for example, said that Jaden Daniels is going to go to the Washington commanders too, but what if the commanders just take Drake May at two, right? What if he's a Dan Quinn type guy? You know what I mean? Um, I mean, I still think it's going to be Daniels at two. Caleb Williams one, Daniel, uh, Jaden Daniels two. Um, you know, <clears throat> the interesting thing would be like, obviously it tracks that it would probably be Drake May at three, but what if J.J. McCarthy is the pick at three? To me, now you're saying, okay, Drake may be in the guy, the apple of the giant's eye. If they love him as much as it sounds like they do, he doesn't get to four and not become a giant, right? Like now that, that becomes tough because then you have the Cardinals know that maybe, and they're trying to get you to sell the farm and you're like, well, I'm trading up, but it's only from six to four. So I'm not giving you the moon, right? that would create some, some crazy, uh, some crazy draft night stuff, man. We get a live draft going. If we get a live chat going during that, I mean, I got to work the phones though, too. So this is going to be tough, but this is going to be something to, this is going to be something to turn over as, uh, as we, as we host a live draft on draft night. That's for sure. Danny Escalade says, Dan, DJ's got to sit, let new blood play. Shadur Sanders would be better than Caleb Williams. Did you see Colorado versus USC? I did, says Lewis. BBU says, why are you screaming in all caps? <laughs> Big Dash agrees with Lewis on the Shador versus Caleb. Um, Chris Peace, again, bringing it. Dante Miller is our savior, says T. Let's go. Big Dash likes a Dunze more than neighbors. Well, and that's what I was talking to Schefter about, Big Dash, is, you know, Schefter said, like, there are literally people around the league, and this is true. That like, you know, one person says they like a Dunze best. Another person says Marvin Harrison Jr. is the number one. Another person says neighbors is their number one. Like that's how good these three receivers are. That's it's it's fascinating. Uh Lewis says, too many people watching Disney movies on that Dante Miller guy. <laughs> Lewis, I like you, man. I like you. <laughs> Neighbors wasn't lying. Giants quarterback situation stinks, says Lewis. The Crunch Bunch says, regarding the May news, do you get a sense that the Patriots are willing to trade down or that they're possibly taking McCarthy? Uh, both of those things have come up. Both of those rumors have come up, that they're entertaining the trade down. I mean, they are taking those calls. And then that they're possibly taking McCarthy. Um, that has sounded more like a rumor to me. I don't know how much there is to that or not. Um I do think actually, now that you mentioned that, did our did our friend Tony Pauline report that they want JJ McCarthy at three, the Patriots, and that that was the word? So 
Tony is plugged in, man. I love Tony. He's going to be coming on the podcast too this month. Look for that. Um, and I think Tony had been hearing that JJ McCarthy and the Patriots were a match. I think that was his report. And so that's why, that's why I'm coming down on this. Like, listen, if Drake may somehow gets the four, you know, the giants indeed feel that way about him. I mean, he's a giant at that point, isn't he? Big dash says, let Miller live, uh, met, let Miller live without all the expectations right now. He's just a guy on the 90 man. Great story. And I'm rooting for him. Yes. Big dash. Yes. Yes. Agree. Agree. Yeah. Like that to answer the Miller question, like that is to me, that is a, like Shane does this with players and GMs do this with players. Like, Hey, we scouted this guy for this draft. We liked him here as this, right? Now he comes available. We find a creative way to acquire him. And now we see what he looks like in the spring and we see what it looks like. It's not, it's really nothing more than that. Any validity to the giants having alternate helmets this year? Crunch bunch says, um, crunch bunch. I, I haven't been, uh, told that, uh, did somebody report that? I didn't see that, but I know that as alluded to earlier, the hundred year means a lot to the giants and to the organization. So I think they're going to come out with some things like I said, and I've, I've told John Mara this to his face. I love the red uniforms. I don't care that they're bad luck. I don't care that the team loses when they wear them. I don't care. Break them out. I love the red. Love the red. Got to get a hashtag going for that. Rock the red. How about that? Hashtag rock the red for the 100th anniversary. Um, let's see. Yeah, maybe related to the 100th year, says Bill. Um Mark says, I came in about 40 minutes ago, just letting you know I'm listening and learning. Thank you, Mark. Always a big supporter and contributor. Appreciate you. Kevin says, thoughts on Max Melton, corner out of Rutgers. Definitely a guy who kind of falls in that mix as a player to watch for the Giants. Um, uh, you know, could, could he be a second rounder? Um, I think I, I think he's in more in that range. Second, uh, those middle rounds, the second, third. The second round is really going to be, I think, a corner rich round. I think is the way a lot of people are start seeing it shaping up. It was a guy who was at the uh, pro day, the the local pro day for the Giants. Um, so a guy to keep an eye on. Chris says, "Wait, what are we talking about? Dable not a quarterback whisperer. How many games did Tommy DeVito start and win?" Chris, he might have taken like an all time record high percentage of sacks for a quarterback in NFL history. They won those three games because their defense forced about 50 turnovers in those three games. DeVito, I will say this, three nice touchdown passes in Washington um, and some really good runs against Green Bay and like two key throws in, in key situations there. And listen, he did it. But by and large, like that stretch of three wins was the defense. I mean – they beat that. They beat the New England Patriots in a game where the defense basically just like kept a lid on the Patriots' offense for four quarters, <laughs> right? I mean, let's not let's not kid ourselves here. Uh, let's see. D Kit says Chris Devito did not play like an NFL quarterback. He made some throws, yes, but the wins were on the defense, who forced like thirteen turnovers during that span. D Kit, great minds. I didn't even see your comment. Great minds. MJ says, is there any worry about Daniels being the next RG3 with that frame? D Kid agrees there is to him. Yeah, no, that's for sure. And that's what I was saying earlier. Like the Giants are, you know, they were a team that wouldn't have taken a Bryce Young. They would have taken a CJ Stroud, like if they were in last year's draft. And they they let the size, strength, weight, speed, big arm, right? Like those are things that they gravitate to. Those slight frames and stuff, like that's not them. Mark says, uh, Mark is saying hi to everybody. Dash, Peace, Bill, Tuto, everybody else he's seeing. We're rocking tonight, Talking Ball Live with Pat Leonard. Thank you guys all for supporting us here. I've never seen a draft with so many variables, says Visfor. I know, I know. I, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's, there's as much drama and as many revolving doors to this and intrigue as I can remember. John P says, I will be in London for Dave Matthews concert on draft night. Yeah, DMB still brings it. I saw him uh, what down in down in Jersey, the PNC Arena last summer. Great show. Enjoy that, John P. 
You're going to be checking in on your iPhone. Your service is going to be going out. So wait, you're going to be, John P., you need to log into the live chat from the DMB show. Give us the set list. How about that? Mark says, I think with the expectation or the with the exception of Caleb Williams, all these quarterbacks have obvious bust potential. Yeah, I mean, even like you just never know. You just never know with these guys. Um, you know, is, what is it? A 50 percent hit rate ish on quarterbacks in the first round, really, over the course of the last decade? Something like that. Maybe not even. Chris says he went from not being allowed to throw the ball Jets game. That was a wet game. Not saying he played well, but coached up a UDFA to win a few, albeit meaningless games. I mean, yeah, the, the, come on. They they won those games with their defense, Chris. Um, again, they did make it work for a time there, but that was a that was a defensive led winning streak. Part of the reason why the DeVito craze, even though I'm really happy for Tommy, um, was, you know, I mean. The, the real story, as you guys know, was occurring behind the scenes, behind the scenes throughout that show. Shannon says, uh, somebody says that Neighbors is way closer to Marvin Harrison Jr. than people think. BBU says Jordan Rano from ESPN said today on his podcast that the Giants were to move up for a quarterback of their choice. It would actually be for Daniels and not May. Interesting. Yeah, that's uh, that you know the frame part of it. I mean, he's explosive, he's productive. Um, I haven't heard that though. That's obviously different information than what I have. Crunch Bunch says, "I believe Tony Pauline said Elliot Wolf loves McCarthy." Right. Thank you, Crunch Bunch. Brad says, "Whoever gets the most separation, I want them. No more 50-50s. Yep, I agree. Kevin says, "Quarterback out of Tennessee has a cannon and is raw. Can learn and develop under Coach Dable. Similar skill set as Drew Locke." Yep, Joe Milton the third. Uh, get up, get him in the late rounds, maybe. Um, if the Giants don't draft one high, I would keep a name out for him. Has the measurables the type of quarterback they might take a flyer on. Mark says, I think outside of the quarterback debate, Giants should prioritize making their pass rush a strength and something to fear, notwithstanding the needs of the secondary. Yeah, and they seem they seem concentrated on that with the Burns trade and signing. Mark, uh, don't disagree. Little Bulldozer also loves the red jerseys. MJ says, red uniforms, bad luck. We can't win in any color. <laughs> that's what I wanted to say to John. I didn't I didn't say it, but that's what I wanted to say. Like, are you sure blue and white are doing, doing any better? Right, 37 sacks by DeVito. And, and also, like, a lot of them were on the QB. They were on the QB. Like that, you know, not, again, not to, not to, crush Tommy, but, and Chris, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but those things are like the offensive line was killing the team early in the season when they were giving up a ton of sacks at that point with DeVito in the game, it wasn't the line. A lot of the time it was the quarterback. Bill still loves Tommy D. Mark says, I think we should not underestimate the resigning of Darnay Holmes plays better in zone. than man could very well be good in the slot. We'll see. I thought he really provided great value on special teams, um, on defense. Darnay has made plays. Um, he is very resilient. Really like him as a guy and as a part of the locker room. Um, you know, needs to improve on not being as handsy on defense. Maybe to your point in the zone, that could work out. Definitely uh, good at blitzing and also, um, you know, kind of living for the next down and making those plays, um, you know. I uh, admired how he kind of pushed through last season. MJ says Washington took a frail bodied RG three Daniel similar build. No. Yeah. Interesting. Big blue fam. What up? Says blazing brazen. What's up blazing D kit says Pat, this channel and ch uh, this channel and chat are gaining some serious steam. The concept is so simple. You answering questions from fans, but it is very effective. D kit. Thank you. And you know what, honestly, like, here's the thing. I don't know why it didn't occur to me until whatever this year or last season. Right. But there's something about the conversation on Twitter and X that isn't natural. Like it's not a, it's not personal. 
right? It's, I mean, I know you can have like the, you can talk and do like the Twitter, um, kind of the Twitter lives and have those chat rooms and that kind of stuff. But I like that, you know, the face-to-face, anything that's close to face-to-face, I think is better. It's more personal. And also to me, what I find in our community here is I think this creates an, uh, um, this creates a, an area and an experience for people to gravitate to that. Like it's, it invites the type of people like yourself who are here to have a conversation and not like get in the comments and blast something about a story you didn't read or, uh, I, I, you make a point in my comments, but then I don't see it for two hours. And then even if it's a really good point, I respond five hours later and then it kind of gets drowned out. It's not really a conversation, you know? And I think that, first of all, I like, I like doing podcasts. I like being on camera and I like interacting with fans, but I like interacting with people. Like if I didn't do this for a job, I would be you in this chat with a different reporter. Like that's, that would be me, you know? And, um, that's what I am. I'm a sports fan who became a sports writer and a journalist and a reporter and an analyst or whatever you want to call it. But, um, I have just as much passion for this as you guys do uh, for this team, for this league, for this sport. And really, um, I genuinely, I know I say this a lot, but like, I'm not blowing smoke. Like I really, really am grateful to you guys in these chats, um, for contributing, for, for being here, for supporting the channel, whether it's with a question, a like, a super chat, a super sticker, whatever it is. But DKIT, thanks for saying that. And thanks for being here. And thanks for helping it grow. Um, you know, I have to say a lot of the people here, you know, uh, like Tudo, somebody who comes to mind right off the top of my head, but like authentic uh, as a guy who's always in here showing love. Um, you know, a lot of you Giants fans with pull and reach and, um, you know, who really resonate with the fan base and have a good head on your shoulders about what makes a good conversation and good back and forth about the Giants. And also, like I say this all the time, you guys teach me and show me things that I should be paying more attention to, or you jog my memory about something, or, you you know, I think of an anecdote that might inform you on something we're talking about. Uh, but anyway, I appreciate you. Thanks for saying that. Blazing Brazen also says, Pat, I rocks with you, my man. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Brazen. Bill Hartnett says, thanks for the show, Pat Hartnett. Thank you for that, for that two bucks, that super sticker. Really appreciate you. Big Dash says, May is so risky to me. What happens when Daniels is not the best athlete on the field? Yeah, I don't know. You know, when I was talking to Phil Sims, I mean, not that, you know, I listen, Phil thinks that he's the second best quarterback in the class, but he was calling into question, you know, whether his arm would be suited for December weather in New York, New England, places like that. Something to think about. Um. Let's see, Joe Milton, 6'5", 246, built like a tight end. Accuracy of a tight end as well. <laughs> Chris, we got to get you on a on a draft show, man. That's some that's some great that's a great uh, one liner there. BBU says Giants need to make the legacy and color rush uniforms our permanent uniforms and add a red legacy alternate. BBU, let's go, let's go. I love it. BBU, such a good point. Those legacy games, man, when they painted the red zone, uh, when they painted the end zone red two years ago for the legacy game, I almost lost my damn mind when I walked in the stadium. I, I went right up to like the first person with the, that works with the Giants. I saw like their head of security or somebody. And I said, that should be the end zone every game. <laughs> that was the first thing I said to him. B says, I think May is his problems are coachable. Daniels has more concerns that are not. MJ says it may have PFF, uh, but they talked about the elite quarterbacks all have low sack rates, even the ones who have had poor lines. And it translates if they were low in college, same in the NFL. That shocked me. Interesting. Well, it's, yeah, especially because college offenses and NFL offenses, I know they're more similar now than they used to be, but you know, much less complicated and typically very different from what these guys are being asked to do. 
But I think that speaks to like what a guy's processing power is, uh, how quickly he makes decisions, right? It's hard to, you know, like you look at Daniel Jones, like it's, it's hard to coach a guy out of his decision-making process, whether it's uh, like, if it's a little slow and the game speeds up, let's say um, it's, it's hard to change those things. That that's interesting insight, MJ. Crunch Bunch says, what was the Giants thought process for signing Drew Locke? Doesn't strike me as a dependable backup quarterback. I'd be a lot more confident in the QB position if Tyrod was still here. Yeah, well, you know, Tyrod got healthy from broken ribs or probably they were still broken, but he was ready to play and he was cleared. And then they kept him on the bench for Tommy DeVito. So him coming back to the Giants was not going to happen, unfortunately, Crunch Bunch. So another situation, in my opinion, mishandled in that moment by the Giants. Um, you know, I think, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to say it's really looks like the type of move you make when you're planning to draft a guy, but you're also not quite sure what you can count on with Daniel Jones coming off the injury. So you're hedging against that. You're not sure how much lock is going to have to play based on Jones recovering based on the guy you're drafting. So he's kind of like that middle ground where you're not investing too much. Um, now, is he like the Sam Darnold type who's trying to get another shot to be a team starter and get paid? No, right? He's not there. Um, he's past that. So, listen, I don't mean to be negative, but that's the – that's kind of like – they're a bad team. <laughs> they're a bad team. And that's where an opportunity like that comes for a guy like Locke. Crunch Bunch says um, – if DJ's out the first few weeks of the season, depending on Locke, seems questionable, depending, uh, considering Dable and Shane's jobs are on the line. Well said, Crunch Bunch. Well said. Brett M says, Pat is our guy on the inside. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Kevin says, who is the most likable coach on staff? Uh, let's see. Most likable coach on staff. Jerome Henderson, maybe um, Jerome Henderson from the secondary, the defensive backs coach. Every time we meet with those assistants, he is so helpful, so honest, so direct. Uh, there's nothing you can't ask him. Um, very helpful, friendly, uh, good person from what I can tell. So I'll go Jerome Henderson. Brolo with a $3 super sticker. Thank you, Brolo. Appreciate you. Thanks for the support. D Kit says, Pat, guess who has an historically low um, P2S rate? My guy, Penix. Interesting. Lewis says, and I didn't calculate. Um, let's see. D Kit says, Pat, last thing, who is Shane's inner circle? Just curious. Um, well, if I if I'm understanding your question correctly, D Kit. It's, you know, Joe Shane, oh, pressure to sack is P2S. Yeah. So, so you're saying pressure to sack ratio for Penix is historically low. Got it. Dude, I'm telling you, he's, he's the, he's an impressive player. Penix, impressive player, like hard guy to watch in person and not fall in love with his game. Like immediately, seriously. Um, Lewis says, oh, I didn't even calculate the Tyrod situation in my D minus grade of Joe Shane. <laughs> so D kit Joe Shane's inner circle. Well, you know, Brandon Brown's the assistant GM. So that's one of his guys, Ryan Cowden, who he brought over from the Tennessee Titans is, is his guy. Right. So that's part of the inner circle. Um, and the way the giants are operating, you know, you have Tim McDonald, um, you have obviously, uh, Brian Dable, and really, like this organization, as much as they talk about alignment and that, that they're aligned coach and GM, right? But as much as it is a quote unquote collaborative process, coaches involved, scouts involved, this is a Joe Shane, Brian Dable decision making operation when all is said and done. Like the decision, the final decisions that are made, it's Joe Shane and Brian Dable making the calls, right? And Joe Shane makes decisions on the game day roster calls as well who's up, who's down. He influence he influences that, right? So 
this is part of the reason why you get the credit or the blame if you're Joe Shane in this situation because you have your hands and everything. Hope that answered that question, DKIP. Brett says Wink will be the most likable next year, probably. Oh, Brett M as Wink back on the Giants staff next year. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't uh I wouldn't I wouldn't bet on that. By the way, how about Adam Schefter's comment about Wink in the interview? Did you guys see that? So I asked Adam Schefter in my uh, podcast. You can watch it if you've missed it. Um, I asked him about Wink Martindale and about how the how excited they are in Michigan to have Wink because Adam's very plugged into Michigan. He's an alum. So he gave this answer about how they're happy to have Wink there. They know he's, he, you know, he knows Wink's fired up to be in Michigan. There's a lot of defensive talent there. And he says, you know, it's kind of going to be on Wink and the defense early on to hold the fort while the offense, which has so many new players on it, finds its footing and gets some experience. And then he said this. This is Adam Schefter saying this on my podcast. I think Wink is really excited about the challenge of being in Ann Arbor, working with a great head coach like Sharon Moore, and moving forward here in a new environment and a new setting. I think he's happy with all the new voices in his ears right now. Yo, when Adam... When Adam said that, I almost keeled over and died. I actually didn't have a chance to react to it fastly enough, fast enough. It was so funny. It was so funny. Like in the moment, I didn't hear it for what it was. But talking about Wink being happy with the new voices in his ear, clearly an allusion to all the BS going on in the headsets with the coaching staff and with Dable uh, next year or last year. God, what a, what a line from Schefter. The Giants were somehow to go offensive tackle. Who would you think is the pick, Olu or Alt? I don't know that, BBU. I don't know that. Alt profiles as their kind of guy, for sure, though. I would say that. Um, if McCarthy falls to six, do the Giants take him over neighbors in Adunze? Would they feel the need to trade up to four to get him? Yeah, I don't know that, Crunch. Um, it's a really good question. Like, some people... Some people feel like they like McCarthy, but not in the top 10. Um, so maybe it would be neighbors of Dunze there. Um, so I don't know, maybe neighbors. It's a good question though. I mean, I know Sh Shane has a, I mean, listen, a lot of people have a high opinion of Washington, but Shane has a very high opinion of Washington's roster. I know that. Uh, let's see. MJ says, I know Wink is very talented, but isn't it odd? No NFL team made an offer or even an interview, I believe. Uh, there was a lot going on behind the scenes, a lot of overtures and conversations there. Um, I think the – MJ, I think um, there's more to that story. Definitely the idea of like, you know, were, were people – were people telling stories around the league about what happened and were certain teams maybe scared off by misinformation about what went down in New York, right? Because sometimes head coaches, they look at that and they say, wow, this guy could really help my defense and my team, but there's all this drama surrounding him. I'm hearing different versions of these stories and I'm just going to stay away, right? So I think there's a good chance that maybe it was related to something like that. Um, not necessarily fair to Martindale, not fair at all to him, honestly. But, of course, the way that um, he left and the way that things went, even if the truth is that um, it was a really sour situation and it wasn't just Martindale and the coach, it was the coach and a lot of people, he ends up kind of bearing the brunt of that as far as the NFL. But also, look around right now. Wink Martindale, Bill Belichick, um, Pete Carroll, Mike Vrabel, um, a lot of older, experienced, veteran, respected coaches, not with jobs in professional football this year. Um, so he's far from the only one. And um, that's why I know a lot of older coaches are looking at this with it, with their eyebrows raised about this recent coaching cycle, not pleased uh, with how this went in general. Lewis says, I noticed Schefter was surprised how high J.J. McCarthy was regarded in this draft. Yeah, that was interesting, right? He felt like, you know, not top six, but top 10, 12, right? So, yeah, interesting. D Kit says, I'm making a call. JJ with the sixth pick. There, I said it. Wouldn't surprise me. Rich S says, what are the chances we draft a running back in the third or fourth round? Um, Rich, I think that's very possible. Um, 
I think uh, running back in the mid to late rounds makes sense. Um, I do think third round seems rich for where the Giants value the running back position. But obviously, if you're thinking, oh, the Saints got an Alvin Kamara in the third round, right? It's not a first round pick. So that, that's a way of looking at it. Blake Corum, Bucky Irving, Marshawn Lloyd. Um, and I will say this, I'll leave you with this. Trevor Sikama drafted a different running back for the Giants in a later round. I think you'll be fascinated to see what weapons and what players the Giants acquired in the mock draft that I did with Trevor, the lead NFL draft analyst for Pro Football Focus, on tomorrow mornings, April 10th, uh, dropping our podcast, Talking Ball with Pat Leonard podcast. Check that out on the YouTube channel um, and wherever you get your pods, Apple, Spotify, if you listen on audio instead. Guys, this has been great. We've gone two and a half hours, and honestly, it doesn't feel like it. Um, you know, this has been amazing. Uh, this has been – I always feel like, hey, this is this is one of our best chats yet. I feel like I'm always saying that. But you're right. As D Kid said, this is continuing to grow, continuing to blossom, continuing to flourish, and it's because of you guys. Um, it's because of you guys and what you're bringing to these chats, creating this momentum and your love and appreciation for your team. Um. And remember, we are sponsored by Bet Online and also by Estate 98 Coffee. Essencia de Cafe from El Salvador dates back to 1798. Here's the Tumblr. Get it. TikTok shop, Instagram, wherever you want. You can make a nice coffee in three seconds. Amazing. Um, remember, I will not be doing another live because I'll be away for a little bit until April 18th. And then we will be raring to go. Raring to go. Uh, leading up to and through the NFL draft. We'll have a lot more podcast episodes dropping, a lot more special guests. Uh, check out the Dan Weederer episode. Check out the Adam Schefter episode. Check out the Trevor Sikama episode. Tolly, Paul, Tony Pauline's going to be coming down the pike along with many more. Um, let's see. what Two more came in. Crunch Bunch said, what are your thoughts on Giants being linked to a running back like Trey Benson who's projected to go in the early rounds? Yeah, that doesn't add up to me with their philosophy on running backs, Crunch Bunch, but clearly they're looking at backs. I think that is clear. BBU says, Pat, you're Joe Shane. If Buffalo calls you and offers you the Julio trade, I don't remember the amount of picks, for one of the wide receivers, do you pull the trigger on that? Ooh, that's fascinating. BBU, let's jump into that next show. Um Boy, that's something to think about, right? Like the uh, something that can just completely revamp your team. Um, but the Giants are in a position where they feel like they might be able to get a franchise changing quarterback, let's say. So that's a tough call. It's a good question. We haven't had a question like that yet, BBU. Something for me to think about. Rich says, we'll check it out. Thanks, Pat. Lewis says, great show. Mark Thompson says, great show. Great show, Pat. Get some rest until next time. Uh, Ian says, I have to admit, Pat Leonard is becoming more likable and not doing hit pieces or starting drama. <laughs> Ian, come on, man. Why you got to leave me with that backhanded compliment? I mean, a story about the inner workings of the Giants, just because it's not what you want to hear about your team. It's not a hit piece. It's just what it's what happening with the team. Promise you. Listen, hopefully this team starts winning and there's more positives to talk about. Uh, D kit says I have a ton of likes compared to the total number watching right now. Great completion percentage. Jolly good show says Lewis. Brett says, thank you. You're not so bad, Pat. <laughs> oh man. Ian says, keep it up though. Uh, yeah, pretty good one. Ian says, Bill, I got to get out of here before the backhanded compliments keep flooding in my lights going out, man. We're ready to go talking ball with Pat Leonard. See you next time. Thanks for being here, guys. Thank you so much.